Hey, everybody. <laughs> this is uh, the latest and hopefully greatest episode of the Delta Bravo Urban Exploration Team Mission Statements Podcast. And um, while my accent might be very different from the accent that you're used to hearing, um, I am really excited about um, sort of guest hosting this <laughs> pod um, because one, it means a lot to me. And I really think we owe it to Jimmy Ferrari to give him a chance to explain and to take us through this amazing uh, road trip that he took primarily to go out, visit spots, hit spots across the country. Um, I know a lot about it because I've heard a lot about it already, but I thought it was only uh, fair and and the right thing to do to give uh, Jimmy a chance to uh, tell his stories uh, uninterrupted and um, and he gets to be the guest. I will try to kind of facilitate and put out some uh, questions, but I really wanted to shine a light on on Jimmy and uh, and really kind of thank him for the work he's been doing on behalf of Delta Bravo, because I know I listen to all of these episodes already and I wait for them to drop. And uh, now, uh, without further ado, and I <laughs> hope you can see him already. Uh, and... Uh, uh, oh, by the way, I'm Andy Katz, and uh, and and I threw it. I threw the idea out to Jimmy. Hey, like I should interview you for one of these, and he was like, "Yeah, yeah, cool." So, um, without further ado, Jimmy Ferrari from uh, from Brooklyn, New York. Well, well, well. Thank uh, you, Andy. I'm I'm glad to be a guest on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had the cool graphic behind me. I should have worn my Delta Bravo hat. Yeah, but... it's all right, man. Um, well, it's funny because. Before we press record, you like, you know, you like to be involved in story. So as you were saying, uh, <laughs> you know, shine the spotlight, you know, on but I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, I talk so much on this also. It's like, it's really bad. I really try my hardest. I really do. I fail a lot to not interrupt and, and, and because I want to talk about this shit so much. So that's exactly why we're here because. I know I've been in that position where you're so excited to compliment the story or add to add like something, or you're like, yes, that's how I feel. Or yes, I've been there. Or this yeah. is what I found out. And I know like just listening to you, it's all enthusiasm. It's all passion. So I get it. And yeah. I thought that's why we should dedicate one of these episodes to you exclusively. I'm easy. I'm easy. I'm like, all right, I'll just talk. Everyone hears me talking anyway. So I'll talk more. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, man. So um, let us, like, I guess, take us through. Um, those of you who know um, right. Jimmy, and maybe you've seen a lot of the the, the, the uh, posts that he's made, uh, probably are aware of a trip that he planned and set up and, um, and already has come back from. I yeah. think in some of the other episodes, you were still, I guess, on the trip when the episode dropped. So you were talking about going on it. And yeah, back and, and, and yeah, po yeah. Podcast time is weird because yeah. there was a couple of episodes that I was talking. I think maybe Joe Schellinger, maybe I was talking, and that episode was dropping in a couple of days. But I was talking about the road trip, but I was like, I feel like I'm talking about this road trip way too much. I'm not even on it yet. You know yeah. what I mean? So, uh, all right. So yeah, this is cool because it's um. The last episode, we're on podcast time, so the last episode I recorded, which has already dropped, is with Danny Johnson. I talk about a specific thing, but not too much in detail about the road trip because of the subject matter that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So I had to, you'll, you've already heard it. But anyway, um, yeah, man, it, um, it, this is something that w with without the Delta Bravo team, I definitely wouldn't have done this road trip, at least not yet. Um, I know that the running theme with a lot of the guys is it's an excuse to go out and travel. It's an excuse to get out of the house. Um, I'm never bored ever. Um, like ever. I just wish there was more time to do this kind of stuff. Um, so I, I've never done a road trip to this extent at all. I've talked about it for years, even before Delta Bravo, just 
getting out of here and driving halfway across the country or cross country or whatever. So now with this whole Delta Bravo thing, I'm like, you know, it was spoken about here and there and then something comes up and we don't pull the trigger on it. And the next thing you know, it's two years later. I'm like, you know what? This has to happen. And there was a couple of things that this entire trip was basically based around. Um, two things in particular. One was obviously I wasn't at the outsider's house yet. That needed to happen regardless. And also kind of along the lines of what Danny Boy did is somebody had the the same vision as Danny and they refurbished and saved the, the original gas station from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre from 1974. Mm -hmm. And what they did with it, they built like five cabins behind it that you can rent for the night or however long you want. And being, I'm a huge, everybody should know at this point, I'm a huge horror fan. I like so much different stuff. I mean, not taking away from anything else whatsoever, but Texas Chainsaw Massacre is probably, gun to my head, it's probably my favorite horror movie of all time. Wow. So when I heard that they did that, I'm like, me and Nikki were talking about it. I'm like, I need to go to Texas. Like, I want to stay at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre gas station. I don't care how it sounds. I'm a movie horror nerd. I want to do that. So when we pulled the trigger on this road trip, that was, Texas was the first drop, the first, you know, where, where we wanted to go to. And then from there, I figured out what's the closest airport because I wanted to fly one way for time in my vacation. I, I flew one way from JFK to Austin. And then once, because that, that was like the closest airport to the gas station. Yeah. So once we once I knew the where, where the Austin airport was, and then I started to spread around. And I'm like, okay, once we land, I don't care what time it is, but we wound up late, landing late on a Friday night. And I was like, okay, we I want to get a hotel super close to the airport because I already started mapping out spots. And the goal was to get as many spots in that area, in the Austin area, and then work our way down to Bastrop, Texas, where the gas station was. And technically the first night, the first full night after the first full day is we stay at the gas station. So it was crazy because I have, I have it right here. So pardon me. One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. We hit 11 different spots the first day. Wow. Yeah. Um, and it's crazy because you, you know this just as well as the, everybody else that, that does this stuff. When you're going on a mission or if you go into a specific area and you're mapping something out and you're looking for things in a specific area, like you've been to Europe, and like so you know the deal. So once you start going down this rabbit hole, it seems like you find stuff and then more stuff and then more stuff. And it's like, wow, like I can't believe that Austin and the very surrounding small little towns around it now I have to pick and choose because now there's so many things. There's yeah, you know, so what, what is, much. Yeah. One of the things that I love is that when you find a spot you've been looking for for a long time, oftentimes there's a, a another picture uh, that you that you love, and then you realize, wait a minute, that was the same photo shoot or the same day. Yeah, the same, maybe the same half hour of time. Sure. And then you can then you start. You almost, I don't know if this happened to you. But you you see a picture and then you turn and you realize that everybody turned you know, 30, 30 years ago and walked 100. 10 pages. You know what 100%. I mean? Like, you're like, oh, I'm walking in the same the same path that they're walking. And, yes. And doing the same things that they were doing in the same order. And you realize that's why it was like click, click, click. And then you got a whole a whole roll of film. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow, I, so I, I wound up taking 
whether it's pictures in order to mash or just regular pictures of, you know, just to take regular pictures. I think I took like 1600 pictures. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can relate and I don't want to, I don't want to get into my stuff at all, but I, I, I always take more pictures than necessary to make Me sure too. I've matched it up right. Me but too. also I, I love that, you know, you went in so prepared, you have oh, everything, everything mapped out. Um, and I know you're going to get to this. Yeah, um, but months. But the, whole, the whole idea, you know, I keep thinking, and this is probably going to come up in my head a lot while you're talking, is that if I planned the same exact route, if I went to Austin and I drove back to Maryland or Brooklyn or wherever you, you ended up, how different our experiences would be. Oh, absolutely. Just because of what we like and what of we're course. into. And there'd be some overlap, no question. It definitely um, would. But, but I love... I love the open endedness of this is that, you know, what really gets you going are these horror movies and these um, these uh, I mean, and they're films I'm familiar with for the most part. I know you and I have had some conversations about like B or C movies that no one's ever heard about. I love and it. I, yeah, I, I do have an affinity for Basket Case and we can talk about that later. But <laughs> I do. Um, it's but, such yeah, a terrible but, movie, but it's so good. Exactly. So anyway, I yeah, go ahead. So you're in Austin. Yeah. So so we stay now. Another thing is once I had every single day mapped out, I'm looking at towns, this, that, time frames, how many miles. Okay, from here to here, there's really nothing here. All right, so it's three and a half hours. So um I'm mapping out. And then every single day towards the end of the night in a different state, for the most part, well, different cities, but I had a hotel room already booked, ready to go. So destination is we need to do this, 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 and this, and then we need to make it to here. If there's a couple of times I have to call. I have a late check-in, this, that, and the other thing. So right. I was, we were all prepared with everything. Um, so... The first you, night you even you even typed it up and had like a beautifully like a, like mapped it, out like a with, with, with this with this stupid background it really might not come up there it well. is but yeah it's I have to do it slow because it'll get all weird and pixely yeah, yeah it's like a goonie it's like a I, I customized like a Goonies map into a Delta Bravo map and it's behind it and I had this in folders in the car even though I use my phone GPS I still had it yeah. That's great, man. So we, we landed um, in Austin, and as soon as I landed, as soon as we landed, I grabbed the rental. It was a 2021 Ford Edge. I needed, like, a small SUV. I was not going to be in a little small compact car for this trip. No way. Um, and I got to give Nikki props because I drove from the airport to the first little – it was, like, a little shitty little Motel 6, basically – to drop our stuff, shower, get literally like two hours of sleep and up and out. Um, I only drove from the airport to that hotel, which is about two miles away. Wow. And then she drove the rest of the trip? Nikki drove right. the entire way. Wow. Total of 2,867 miles. Total. Wow. Incredible. She because now this is why I had all intentions of driving, especially open road. I don't mind driving at all. I actually love to drive. Me too. She falls asleep when I drive. She's always falling asleep in the passenger seat. So she said she was like, I don't. She's like, I fall asleep. I don't want to miss anything. Mm. So I'm like, listen, you get tired, you let me know. We'll pull over. And it was one time she was like, maybe you could pull over. And then we got out, like we went to use the bathroom at some gas station or whatever. And she was like, you know what? I'm fine. Now it's a challenge to myself. I'm doing this whole trip. I'm like, okay. Because she, she even said it. She's like, she drives and I navigate well. So it works. Like she's bad with navigation, but I navigate well. So she drives. I just tell her, okay, here, here, here. So it just works. I don't know. Great. So, yeah, perfect. Yeah. So we stay at this little Motel 6 right outside the Austin airport. We get up first thing in the morning, and it's like 6.30 in the morning. We got there. It was like 3, 2.30, 3 o'clock after the rental car and all that stuff. So we get up, and I'm not even tired. We're kind of like adrenaline. Like, we know what we're into, what we're in for. 
So the first stop that we went, it was kind of a late ad also. It was like one of those last minute things. I'm like, ah, this isn't going to be the first one. This is going to be the first stop now because it's so close. It was, it, and it's, it's, it sounds cheesy and it's, I guess it's coincidence or maybe ir- ironic. I don't know. But there's a lot of Texas Chainsaw Massacre stuff. Mm-hmm. But, and it wasn't even necessarily intended to be that. It wasn't. So the first stop was in Maynard, Texas, which is literally a little dot right outside Austin. And um, it could, might, might as well be Austin. And um, it was the gas station, another gas station for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2003 reboot with Jessica Biel. All right. And it just so happened that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning in 2006, was the prequel to that Jessica Biel movie. Both movies were shot at that same location. So it was like a two for one, two different movies, same location, different people, different vehicles. So it, there's a difference there. So, but this, this kind of set off the, the, the good vibes, I guess, like the good omen that this whole thing is going to be awesome because we get to this place and it's a functioning, it's like a live music venue and a barbecue spot, right? Go figure. You're in the middle. I'm in the middle of nowhere, Texas, dude. Right. At this point, it's like seven o'clock in the morning, a cup of coffee in my hand. It's brutally hot already. And we pull up and there's nobody there. You know, there's no cars out front, nothing. So I'm taking my my outside shots. I'm standing in the middle of the road and I'm doing my thing. But there's a a shot from the Jessica Biel movie in the back where in the movie it serves as an outhouse, but it's really a shed. Now, I'm also thinking this is almost 20 years ago, which is crazy that this movie came out. So I go in the back to get this outhouse shot and there's the building, the same telephone pole is there like it's right there mm-hmm. so we walk and we're probably about a man, 50 75 feet in the back of this building and i'm taking my shots and i hear something behind me and so does nikki and we turn around and this guy has no idea that we're even in the backyard because we're not loud which is it's early it's quiet so we're just doing our thing we turn around and it, it's so <laughs> it's like typical I'm at a Texas Chainsaw Massacre location, right? So I turn around and there's this guy, an older guy, a little bit heavy set, with a dirty apron on, and he's smoking meat in this giant, like, smoker barbecue thing. I'm just like... He's not wearing what? any of the meat on his face, is no, he? No, he should have. That would have been awesome, right? Oh my so God. I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, me and Nikki, we look at each other like, this can't even be happening right now, you know? So I would have I would have probably run. No, <laughs> hell no. No way. I wanted to talk with this guy, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so I'm like, good morning. And he turns around and he's like, hey, good morning. Like, not shocked, not like, hey, what are you doing here? Nothing. Just a super nice guy just with meat all over the place. And uh, I'm like, how are you? I'm like, you know, I hope you don't mind, you know, and I do my whole thing, like as you would do when you're meeting somebody that they don't know why you're there. You know, I'm taking pictures, but look, he's, you know, movie was filmed. He's like, oh yeah, which movie? I was like, oh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And he starts smiling. He's like, yeah. He's like, "Um, you know, they, they film some stuff inside too. I'm like, yeah, I know. He's like, you guys want to come in? You guys can look around. So and this place was closed for business, you know? So I'm like, yeah. I'm like, this is weird, but this is, uh, of course. So I go in and I, I was prepared with some inside shots in case, you know, I didn't yeah. know it was open or not. So I had shots ready and I go in. We spoke with this guy. His name was George. And we spoke with this guy for a solid half hour inside. And I was taking all my shots and then there was a, another shot. I'm looking around from Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning, the prequel, and there's a weird room of two girls. And I'm like, where was this? He's like, oh, he's kind of looking at it. He's like, oh, wow, like this is in that back room. Like no one even ever uses it. So he goes and he opens the door and it's filled with all kinds of shit now. But I look around, I'm like, this is the room. I was like, 
can I go in there and take it? He's like, sure, go ahead, be careful. You know, there's stuff in there. I'm like, all right. So I got some shots I never thought I would ever get. Wow. That's, yeah. That's and, gold. That's gold. When you have like free run of a place, especially. It happened like, several, it happened place. several times on this trip. Free run happened a few times, which yeah. was amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then um, he was telling us, he's like, yeah, Robert Duvall shot a movie in here. There's pictures of like Robert Duvall autographed pictures in there. It's like a dive run down place. Like the floorboards are all jacked up. It looks like it would be typically in a horror movie in Texas. Like, what was it like Lonesome Dove or something like that? Like, what, uh, Robert he, he, he mentioned it, but it was super. I mean, Robert Duvall was young. He was like in his. He's done a like, lot of stuff too. Right? Yeah. So that kind of set the precedent of this is you know people he set it off like you know what people are friendly here you know what i mean which was nice you know i'm from a neighborhood where everyone has to show eh, insane so it, that, that set it off as being all right this is awesome george ruled he was awesome and i got more shots than i thought i would get from the first stop um so then we went to where well, I have my little map here because I forget, man. It was so much. And then same in, in Mainer, it was cool. It was only like a half a mile down the road, dude. Was it was uh, on the corner of East Parson Street and Lexington Street in Mainer, Texas. Was that whole corner, four corners, where a lot of what's eating Gilbert Grape was filmed. Oh, yeah, man. Those pictures you got there. I, that's good stuff. Yo, so I'm like, I got to look at the wall. I got to get the water tower. I got to get where DiCaprio was climbing up. Like there's like the lawyer's office across the street where Johnny Depp was, you know, you know, messing around with the lawyer's wife. And then there's uh, the, the grocery store where Johnny Depp worked. And then right down, right, like literally half a block away is where he's sitting there drinking coffee and he looks out he sees juliette lewis on her bicycle right there it's all literally 200 feet from one another we parked in like this little strip mall parking lot like it's literally like six stores long and we parked there and we just walked and i crossed the street and this is where the dedication in order to get the shot comes in um they they built a fence, a chain link fence around the entire water tower mm -hmm. with barbed wire on top. So people like you won't go in there. So, so idiots won't pretend that they're Arnie from Gilbert Grape and climb the water tower, right. you know, for Instagram likes or whatever. So right. I'm like, but I'm standing there and I'm like, my angle is way off. Like I can't get the shot from outside yeah. here. So now, I'm, like I said, I'm in Maynard, Texas. There's a couple of more people than the last spot. But I'm like, there's no cops here. What's going to happen? So I hop the fence, and I'm in this little squared off, fenced in, barbed wired area. And I'm underneath this water tower, and I'm looking. I'm getting all these shots, getting all these shots. And then I go to try to get out. And the, the, the top of the fence was, like, dislodged from one of the posts. So every time I'm climbing up, it's pulling back on me. Oh yeah. So, yeah. so it's like, I can't get up and over it because it's it's falling on me. So like the physics wasn't working for me, bro, you know? So I'm like, oh man. So I wind up going over like a few, I guess, few, several feet over and hopping over and I ripped my knee open on a piece oh, of bubble on a piece of barbed wire. Wow. So Nikki's laughing at me. And then she, later on, she's like, you know, it would have been pretty funny if there was like, sh like, 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 like watch dogs in there that were like released on you. I'm like, nice. Like, you yeah, know chopper I mean? sick balls. Yeah, right? chopper sick balls. So yeah. I wound up hopping over the fence. I ripped my knee a little bit. It was no big deal. But I'm like, all right, well, I have a little scar on my knee. And where did you get that scar? Hopping the fence from the Gilbert Grape Tower. I think it's yeah. so random and nonsense. So can you can you say something a little bit about, um, if you could just backtrack, like if you're at home, sure. if you're in Brooklyn and you're planning this trip, because yeah. the question I get asked all the time is like, how do you know where to go? And I, I'm sure the answer is gonna be kind of similar to what you say, but can you yeah. speak to that a little bit? Like what, what did you do to make sure you knew where the Gilbert Grape spots were? Well, I mean, the internet is a beautiful thing. I mean, you know, um, 
So I just, I typed in, I think was Gilbert, no, see Gilbert Grape wasn't even originally, the first initial stop way in the beginning of this was a stop that wound up being like the fifth stop, which is in Austin, um, another text chain, so I'm asking spot. But I found that and I'm like, once you go like, Filming locations for Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part Two, right? And you'll it'll, it'll come out. All right, Austin, this, that thing, and then all right, you click related images. Next thing you know, it's like oh, boom, boom, and then next thing you know, there's an article of this movie and then this movie, and then you'll go to, you know, Austin, you know, Austin visit Austin dot com or something, and then there'll be a whole section of movies filmed in and around Austin. So I'm like, okay, well, this I really have no interest in, whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm like, no way. I had no idea that Gilbert Grape was filmed literally a mile and a half, two miles from the gas station from a Texas chain. So I'm like, I love both movies, even though they're completely different kinds of movies. But I want to check out the water tower. You know, I want to see this stuff. You know, I want to stand there. And the place basically looks exactly the same. Well, on the mask that you got, I mean, I know you hurt your knee, but the angle. Uh, got, I didn't even hurt it. I was laughing. I was like, ah. I feel like you, you've changed your style a little bit. I love that you put the uh, the frame around it, but now you're doing this kind of. Uh, it's like a wispy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're I kind don't... of erasing the edge, but not not in a square. Like I always do a square, but you're you're kind of doing it more like an amoeba shape. And yeah, it, it, I, I, good, I, yeah, I feel like I don't know, like. I, I look back at like all my old mashes and I'm like, oh, like, oh, I wish, yeah. I, you know, like, oh, I thought it was good then. And I get it, you know, you, you, you get better or you find your little niche or whatever. And then yeah. I just started getting, instead of being so boxy, which some people do that well, and it, and it looks I, great. Yeah. You know I, what I mean? Yeah. You know, yeah. and like, I'm not knocking anyone's style. Everyone has their own style and it's great. Um, but I just, I don't know. There was a, a particular one. I think it was, one I did not too long ago. It was um, from the movie Marathon Man. Lawrence Olivier and, he, and his knife comes out of his underneath his wrist. Yeah. And it's, it's, from shot. Under, it's from underneath, right? Yeah, it's from underneath. Yeah. And there's a, just a building behind him. And the way, I don't know, for some reason I was like, I feel like, and I think I, that was the first one that I did like that. And I found it to be easier. I don't know why. Yeah. Everything lines it's- up. Yeah, certain things line up better. And, and and if there's something that doesn't quite line up for whatever reason, instead of distorting the picture, yeah, you just erase something, it, it clicks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't erase anything. I, I basically when I when I, I I select everything on my screenshot and then I use a different select tool to kind of just so, and then I put it on. So I don't erase anything. I just it's just a I don't know. So you know. select and then then do the feathered edge. Yes. Where where I I actually use an eraser that's an airbrush tool. Oh, so okay. Control it, but it's the same ultimate. It's, yeah, it's yeah. I, see, we 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 all have our different little ways yeah. of doing things. Yeah. 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 So I mean, we hit that spot, and then, I mean, we went from a horror movie to Gilbert Grape, and then we went to a lot of people know that I, it's like I like history. And I like true crime and stuff like that. And I had no idea how it was going to work um, because obviously I was never there. I it just everything was super easy. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I can gain access. I don't know. So we went to um, in 19, I think it was 1966. There was um, Charles Whitman, the sniper oh, that, yeah. mm-hmm. that was from on the University of Texas at Austin from the clock tower. And I was like, I want to see that. Like, I just want to stand there and look up at that and just try to, I mean, obviously I would never be able to capture what they felt, but be there knowing the insanity that went on, you know? Um, And I started researching that and I found this really powerful picture, dude, of this college student, this girl, maybe 17, 18, and she's hiding behind the base of a flagpole while Charles Whitman was still firing and shooting her friends and all these college students. And in the background, there's a wounded student that's laying in the grass. 
And I'm like, this poor girl must have been terrified, you know? So I'm like, I want to see that. It's a morbid thing, I guess, but I just, I don't know. And uh, we went there and I'm just like, wow. And a lot of people don't even realize what even happened there. A lot of younger kids, maybe even some of those college students had no idea, you know? And there's two flagpoles there. And I looked and I, looked, I was like, all right, this is definitely the one. And I took my shots and then piggybacking off of what I just said, how scared she must have been. I put myself in her exact position. And I took a picture of what her vantage point was. What was this poor girl seeing while this guy is shooting a sniper rifle down? Yeah, it was hard I, for me not to interrupt you because I, I, I wanted to bring that up. And I just, you did such a good job on that. Um, yeah. it, it was chilling to see that picture. Yeah. And, you know, to your point about it being morbid, there's a couple of things that I've done and I know you're going to get to Dallas soon, but there's a couple of places I visited. And uh, one of them was really early on when I was still sort of feeling out the whole Delta Bravo group and what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And I found this picture of John Hinckley Jr. in front of not the Hilton where he shot Reagan, but he's in front of the Ford's theater, in, uh, huh. which I thought was like really weird. That yeah. He's the, He's standing against the wall of Ford's theater, the, the most famous assassination, right. uh, one of the one of the most famous assassinations sure. of all time. And then years later, he tries to assassinate a president. And I just thought, this is morbid or macabre, whatever word you want to use. Right. And I actually had like a little disclaimer. And I said, hey, I hope this is OK to post because it matched up really well. And, and sure. it, it was a powerful image and it was a powerful feeling. Yeah. And I think it is OK. I mean, you also yeah. brought up. That it's it's history, and I think yeah. that's what you even said when yeah. I posted it. Like, it's history, you know. It's not like you're making this up or you're not, no. you're not making light of anything. No, in fact, I'm not glorifying it at all. Right. I'm just like this. Maybe somebody doesn't know about this, and this is. It was like the first like mass shooting, like with an automatic, you know, weapon, and, and it was. There's a lot that goes along with that, and for that time frame, it's the '60s. It's you know, there's this protest about Vietnam starting and all this stuff. There's the hippie movement is is booming. And then there's this crazy dude like shooting students in Texas. It's, and and then that one picture, I was like, wow, man. I'm like, there's something about that picture. I looked at it, it's just a powerful picture. And I was like, yeah. I don't know. It's, that, that, well, there that, was a, that whole series you did really flipped me out. And there was one. Um, where you're like, if you look to the bottom of the clock, you'll see a puff of smoke from where yes. the gun was shooting. I thought it was, was he, it was he had just fired a shot, and there's a plume of smoke right there. Yeah, crazy. And then oh, there's yeah. yeah, there was that one, and then there was the one with the plume of smoke, and then there's the one, the aftermath, which is more of it too, and it's sad. But sometimes, listen, sometimes history isn't you know bunny rabbits and you know sunshine. You know what I'm saying? There's there's a bunch of like workers like scrubbing blood off of this concrete after yeah. this guy was it's it's terrible but it's history yeah. sometimes history isn't pretty and and you know like i said i wasn't glorifying it in any way at all no you were you did a great job and i i i was i thought that the one that you did of her view of the clock tower was was really poignant and yeah um, it was like a little extra thing that. that was, was really like a, smart yeah, it was an extra thing because when, as soon as I saw that picture, that's one of the first things I thought. Like, if she pokes around, if she, if she was had the nerve at all to, but this girl maybe didn't even look up. I don't know, you know. But if she looked, what would what would she be seeing? And yeah. and I just looked, and and as I was crouched down like her, and I had my phone, I'm looking up. I'm like, Jesus. And even that the picture is kind of deceiving, but when you're there, it's a lot closer than you think. Well, and also you were bringing this up earlier about access. This is right in the center of campus, right? There's yeah. no fences or it's it's still um, part of the campus, right? Yeah, we parked. It was like, I don't know, it was like a 50 cents for a parking meter because I don't, just in case, I don't know. And it was on campus and we just walked and we were there for maybe a half hour. I sat on those steps for a minute and I just looked out at the big area where he was shooting down into like the whole area. 
Nikki's over there laying on the steps in 110 degree weather, loving the sun like a lizard. I'm like, it's what are you doing? It's like it's nice and hot. I'm like, yeah, you're out of your mind. Yeah. Yeah. So there I am, crouched behind flagpoles like a weirdo. She's taking the sun, whatever. But uh, so yeah, that was super heavy, man. And um, so once once we left that. We went to a really cool spot. And this was another thing that I found kind of later on. Um, I don't know how many people watch it. I know, you know, more, more people obviously watch The Walking Dead than Fear the Walking Dead. I watched both of them. And it was another thing that came up like on this rabbit hole of Texas locations where an entire episode of Fear the Walking Dead was filmed. And if you're watching the show, it looks like it would be a set, you know, but it's not. It's in Wimberley, Texas, and it's a place called Pioneer Town. And it's literally like a ghost town in Texas. It's and they didn't even dress up the set at all. It's identical, except maybe it's like a it's all obviously it's more gray and it's like a, a dust storm or some shit that's going on in the show. But the buildings themselves are the same. And it was like the small, in the show, in the episode, it looks like it's this huge, big town. But it's really like four little small, like, I guess you could say blocks. And it's like opera house, and there's this, and there's that. So, the, the, like what you were saying before, it's like, oh, you, you, you're taking a picture here, and then you turn around, there's another one. And you turn around, and there's another one, and there's another one. So that was super easy. And I didn't know what to expect with that one either. I'm like, it's a ghost town. I don't know if there's homeless people. I don't know if there's drug addicts. I don't know what's going on there. No, there was like other like families with small children. It was super cool. I mean, it was blazing hot out, but it was just super cool to be there. It was just, everyone was friendly. And I just, we just took all those shots. It was super easy. And it was, it was, it was awesome. I mean, it makes such well, a difference when people are cool about it too. Everybody you know, memorable, memorable when they're nice and they're like, they get into it or you tell them what you're doing there and they're interested or they want, they want to start learning more about it. I, yeah. I love when that happens. Yeah. They're honestly, dude, not one person, not one person, the entire road trip looked at us sideways. Not one person was rude. If anything, they were overly nice. Everybody. It was, it, it was awesome. Um, so after that, <coughs> we went to, which was originally the first stop before I got into mapping this out, was we were back in Austin. And, uh, oh, no. You know what? I just messed up. Fear the Walking Dead. It wasn't Pioneer Town. It was the hospital. It was in Austin. The next day, no. Later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Fear the Walking Dead, it was an abandoned hospital, and it's actually an abandoned building. That was that. And then there's a place called the Mean-Eyed Cat, and it okay. used to be called Cut-Right Chainsaws. And in Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2 with Dennis Hopper, um, it was legitimately a, a chainsaw repair and sale shop in the movie. But... What's cool is that they some somebody took it over in like 2005 and created a bar out of it, but they completely embrace the entire Texas Chainsaw Massacre thing because the original Cut Right Chainsaw sign is inside. There's a DVD playing of a loop of the entire scene that's shot there is just playing on a loop at the bar. There's Texas Chainsaw Massacre stuff everywhere in there. You were just in your glory. You were I in was glory. in my glory, dude. The, the outside changed a little bit, but the actual structure was the same. Like, you know, the building itself, you know, obviously, you know, different paneling and different wood and stuff because it's, I mean, that movie was 1986. Um, the inside was a little bit different, but the, the doorways were all the same. You know, it wasn't, the configuration wasn't different except where the bar is. That was like a back room where there was there used to be old chainsaws up on pegboard on the back. But so they they let me behind the bar and they saw what I was doing. They gave me stickers and and fantastic. Dude, it was so cool. Everyone embraces it because it's part of the attraction. You know what I mean? What the one place that I've been that really embraced their identity as a place where a movie had been filmed is 
Woodstock, Illinois, uh, which is where they filmed Groundhog Day. And okay. it's supposed to be Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, but it's Woodstock, Illinois. And so you get there. I was a little almost disappointed because I had kind of like, all right, I think this is the corner where Ned Ryerson uh, comes up to Phil and says, all right. you know, Phil? Uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I think this is it. I'm pretty sure. And then you turn around and there's a plaque on the wall and it says, nice. You know, Phil's corner. You know? so That's like, oh, awesome. Is, they even show where there's a little footprint where he steps in the puddle over and over again. Oh, so really? They, they, they love it. And I, I like that, but I also yeah. like when... It, or it's a really it's a town and they, they understand it was filmed there but life goes on and yeah. then you kind of have to figure out where things yeah work. you know what you just reminded me let me just go back real quick to gilbert grape um in the saw in between the grocery store where johnny depp worked and the little cafe coffee shop where he first sees juliet lewis that that's on each end of this little five to eight store shopping strip whatever in the middle, in the concrete, there is a signature in the in the cement, and it says J D Gilbert Grape, nineteen ninety two or whatever. It's John awesome. Johnny Depp's signature is in the side, wow. and that's his footprint. Great. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Yeah, yeah. I was like, it's that's awesome. Wonderful. That's Especially just cool. because it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's like yeah, it's, it's authentication. It's a Johnny Depp little inscription crazy yeah, I love um yeah so anthony amino and cat slash cut right chainsaws um it was a quick drive by it was a quick you know get out hit and run it was um we were outside of what was it called saint mary's catholic cathedral on east 10th street in austin there was a shot of danny trejo in machete outside <laughs> that church so I'm like, oh, I gotta get it. Come on, how can you, Danny? It's Danny Trejo, and it was like yeah. on. It wasn't even like out of the way to the next spot. So it's like a quick pull over. I'm gonna get out, and take a few shots, and it came out perfect. So yeah. I like the every once in a while, I like the quick hit and runs, you know, on the way to the next one. Well, and then that also brings up the the whole issue of sometimes you get spots because you're there and and something you're not even into. I know uh-huh. you've talked about this before. Sure. And I, my, my example of that is always going to be when I was in Brooklyn. And I was at the uh, the warehouse there, uh, right on the water. And I was there hitting Tribe Called Quest spots and Spike Lee spots. And I realized the same building is in uh, an air supply video called Making Love Out of Nothing at All. That's <laughs> awesome, dude. And I matched it up. <laughs> and I remember I posted it on Delta Bravo. And I think Danny was like, that's all you, bro. I'm <laughs> like, that's all you. <laughs> yeah. It's so, awesome. you know, like, like, See, I do, I do silly stuff like that too. Of yeah. course, I, I, I'm not above any of that, man. Like, Me I, love, I love hitting because it's it's just another like in in your head. It's like another point. Like, all right, I got that. I got that. I yeah, I really pulled that spot. So, yeah, if if I know something's filmed there, if it's a a cheesy 80s video or something like that i'm still gonna do it yeah me too hey, listen if i knew that right on my corner an air supply video was shot i would have done it already of course you're gonna go hey. there this weekend probably right yeah a wham <laughs> video i'm all about right. it <laughs> yeah so that and then we hit pioneer town after that church and then we hit it was another spot in Austin. It was the Friday the 13th from 2009 Outpost. It was like a general store that they stop in, which it changed its name. And the last I looked online, it was like still a functioning. It was like, it was literally like Bubba's general store, like literally. And, but it was, it was abandoned and like for lease. So I got those shots. And then we went down to Bastrop, Texas, and we checked into the gas station. Yeah, and that's but where it's like a bed and breakfast or something, right? Yeah, it's just cabins, you know, but they actually serve barbecue. I got a brisket sandwich from the gas station. It's in the movie, it's called the We Slaughter gas station. Okay. We slaughter the We Slaughter Barbecue and Gas Station. And it's still it says it. We slaughter bar- So it's there's no gas pumps there anymore, but you can buy barbecue in there and there's like merchandise. You can buy like gas station shirts and merchant horror figures are in there. So they turned it into like this. It's definitely a, a, a tourist attraction for horror fans, and it's awesome. Nice. So and once we, one where you did all the interior shots that that were um, sort of the same, but is that the same spot? No. Are you thinking about the house? Yeah, I guess. I guess. Have you not talked about that yet? 
No, not yet. Okay. All right, go ahead. No, 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 no. The, the, the same way you're talking about the first two shots from the first two movies? There's a, there's some interior shots in a hallway, and, and I thought you said it was at the restaurant. Uh, well, yeah, they had, but they had renovated and they made it look the exact same. That's the that's later on. Okay. That's, so now I'm at the gas station from the 1974 Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We check in there, we do a few things, and then from there we drive. It's like 15 minutes away, and the bridge was actually closed. They turned it into a pedestrian walkway in like 2000, like the early 2000s. But it's the opening scene to Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, where they're driving over and Leatherface pops out and chainsaws the guy and they crash. But in the movie, the bridge looks like it's 10 miles long, but it's literally like 800 feet, you know? So I hop another fence because it's closed for renovations or whatever. So I hop another fence and I'm walking down this pedestrian bridge. And it was perfect because the shots that I was taking in the, from the movie, it was at night and I was there at night. So I was, it, I, sometimes I like to do that. If it's dark out in the picture, I like to do a night mash. I try. So it matches better or whatever for whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, so we hit like that. You do black and white over color or vice versa. It's right. Like, so know. we hit that. And then all of that was just day one, dude. That's crazy. That's <laughs> crazy. Unbelievable. That was just day one. Still yeah. Awesome at this point. yeah. Wow. Crazy. Um, second day, um, we wake up, same time. We check out of the gas station. It's crazy. You, you, I walk out of our, I open up the cabin and I look and I'm like, I see Leatherface chasing Sally and it's just like, I just woke up here, dude. Like this, th- like these are the experiences that you can't capture with mashes or anything like right. these, you, you know what I mean? Like if you're into this stuff, like I am, like I felt like I was 12 years old watching this movie and I'm, I'm on the set. Like just very cool. Well, that's and, something and, that I, yeah, that's something you and I have in common because, and I'm sure a lot of people who do this have it in common where they, where while you're there and you, if you have a couple of seconds or even minutes, yeah. you can really picture what it was like when they were filming or when they were taking their picture. Yeah. You can picture, I always, I kind of look at the ground and yeah. figure out where was the photographer standing and sure. the right angle and then really try to picture. I do this a lot with the Beastie Boys images. I'm always like picturing what the city was like where they were just running around town getting their pictures taken in the middle of some random day yeah and yeah so whether it's a, I, I think it's probably even more poignant with movies because you, you can watch it over and over again and, and yeah. you can see them moving through the scenery and the back background yeah so I'm, I'm like that too man i do that a lot yeah just 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 a great experience dude and so like the next day we wake up bright and early we check out of the gas station and we head to Pflugersville, Texas, which isn't far. It's maybe like 10 minutes away. And it was a quick drive by. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get because I looked at Google Maps and I know it's private property and you're in Texas. So listen, if I'm in New York and I have to hop a fence, quick, fit, it's fine. I'm in Texas in the middle of nowhere. I'm, I'm not from there. I'm, I'm going to respect their stuff. You know what I mean? Like. I'm the, I'm the outsider you know what i mean so mm-hmm. so and plus it's not like if i hop this fence i have like three quarters of a mile to walk up a road to get close to a house like they're gonna see me coming and what are you doing here and i didn't need that so right. it was just the opening credits to the best little whorehouse in texas oh uh, yeah with burt reynolds and dolly Parton. but yeah. in the movie in the credits the shot is taken from really far away anyway it's so, like a flyover, right? Isn't it like a plane flying over? Or no, a... it's, it, it's, it's, it, I think the cameraman was pretty much where I was on this oh, outside this, this road. Movie. Okay. Yeah. So I just got out. I took a few pictures, a few angles. I probably took like 12 pictures. I probably only needed to take like two, but yeah. I took like 12, 15 pictures just to be on the safe side because yeah. if I don't get a shot from Coney Island, it's no big deal. I can always go back. When am I coming back to Pflugersville, Texas, dude? You know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah. so I took a few pictures and we kept it moving. And literally, like, it was a, like a mile down the road. 
was another Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's a terrible Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. It was technically the fourth one, The Next Generation, with Renee Zellweger and oh, Matthew wow. McConaughey. Really? Yeah, they, 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 they didn't even acknowledge it for decades. It's really bad, right? Yeah. So now, that's another thing where the house itself is kind of a far distance from the road. So, but I had far shots of the house or whatever, and I would have been all right with that. So I'm taking pictures from the road, not on this guy's property. And I look and I see the silhouette of like this big dude, like standing at the front door. So like looking at me, taking pictures. Now this house is a freestanding house with nothing around it, dude, you know? So instead of looking like a creep or looking like I'm up to no good, I wave at the guy, you know, I wave at the door like, hey, how are you? He comes out, young kid, big kid, like 20 something years old. Um, I don't remember his first name. I can never remember his first name. Nikki knows it, but his last name was Weiss. He's like, how are you? I was like, I'm Jimmy. How are you? And he introduced himself. Let's say his name was Anthony, Anthony, Anthony Weiss, Anthony Weiss. He repeat himself like Jimmy two times. But um, so <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you know, I was just taking pictures from this movie, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he was like, oh, well, if you want, you know, you, you could take, you know, you can come onto the property and you could take some closer shots because I had closer shots of the front door and stuff like that. So I'm talking with him for a while and he was super cool. Let, let us on the property and let us take pictures, not inside, but I mean. It's now, when you meet someone like this, are you telling them like I'm in Delta Bravo? Yes. Or- yeah, okay. I would show him like specific pictures. Like I'll pull up the Instagram page, like, oh, check it out. Like, this is what I do. And, you know, oh, that's kind of, every, nine times out of 10 people are interested. Like, wow, how do you do that? That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So he let us take a bunch of pictures and we shook his hand and he was super nice kid. And I got more shots than I thought I was going to get because he was super friendly, you know? Yeah. So we got those. And then we went to, um, it's in Hutto, H-U-T-T-O. I never even heard of this place until I started researching. Yeah. It's from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre where they, where they actually pick up the hitchhiker on the side of the road where, they, where he jumps into the green van. And in that movie, it just looks like just a long road. There's nothing actually in that shot except for land and a truck and the van and he gets in. There's no identifying anything. But with my research, they built a high school on the opposite side of the street, exactly where it was. So I had a perfect vantage point of where it was. And on my on my old podcast, I had Daniel Pearl on. Daniel Pearl, he was like 24 years old, and he was the major, the, the main cinematographer of that movie. Mm-hmm. So he confirmed that this is where it was. Really? Wow. Yeah. So it was this. Yeah. So he confirmed exactly where it was. Um, so yeah, I got that. And then we went to go figure another Texas Chainsaw Massacre spot from the same Jessica Biel movie, which was in Taylor, Texas, another slaughterhouse. And then we went to another Fear the Walking Dead spot, which is at Dell Diamond Stadium, which was home of the. Round Rock Express baseball team. And it, what was cool about that, I was able to get parking lot stuff, but there was something going on that they were setting up on the field. And I asked a staff member, like some dude, I'm like, yo, man, is there any way? Like, I don't care. I'll give you a few dollars. I don't care. Is there any way I can get onto the field to get this shot? And I showed him, he's like, I can't even get there because of this, that, and the other thing. He's like, but I'll do something for you. I'm like, what? He's like, if you trust me, I'll take your phone and I won't be able to get onto the field, but I'll take shots inside the stadium for you. Oh, wow. I'm like, that would be awesome. And unfortunately, they did not line up anywhere close, but I would have gave this this groundskeeper for the Round Rock Express his his credit because – he actually dealt the Bravo, the damn thing, but he gave it a shot and he didn't have to do that. He was busy running around, but he actually took my phone and disappeared for like three minutes and came back. He's like, I'm like, dude, thank you. And I looked at, I was like, yeah, well, maybe I can make something work, but it didn't work, but But it was, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely cool. Um, 
So right, right after that, literally across the street is another Friday from the Dell Diamond Stadium. So when I'm looking at the maps, it says like 0.2 miles, and it doesn't even put the driving; it puts the footsteps. You know what I mean? So from Dell Diamond Stadium, literally across the street was the barn from Friday 13, 2009, which was right off the side of the road. It's like, it's just so, the, the same exact truck that's in the movie is parked literally in the same spot outside the oh, park. That's cool, wow. Okay. It's like, they didn't even have to even, it wasn't even a prop. It's like, that thing is there, yeah. you know? So that was cool. And then we went to the Baghdad Cemetery in Leander, Texas, which is the opening scene to the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where the corpse is stuck on the big monument and all that stuff. I'm walking in there. I'm like, this is good. And you learn history. Like, that cemetery was started in the 1800s with the burial of, like, a three-year-old boy. And that's how that cemetery be started to become a cemetery. And it's, like, this super old, super old and like you're reading all these plaques and you're doing your history. It's just like, yeah, it's from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but the whole history of this place is super interesting to me. Do you get the feeling that I know, I know you go to like uh, monster cons and things uh -huh. like that. And there's obviously a lot of people that love horror movies. Do you get the feeling that these places have been visited a lot, or is this something that you kind of found your way to but maybe not I, a lot of other people i think i think some places have definitely visited more than others um that cemetery yeah i'm sure i'm sure if you're in texas and you're a horror fan mm. you, you're probably gonna go to that cemetery it's an iconic shot from the beginning of an iconic movie mm -hmm. um the gas station is they i'm sure that their business is booming um right. i don't know how many people have gone to you know, the outhouse that it served as an outhouse in the backyard of that place where George was, who was smoking meat. I don't think very many people were there. You know what I mean? I don't think very many people were at um, the, uh, the gay, the other, the other slaughterhouse, you know what I mean? Like certain things, definitely more than others. There's more things that are geared more towards come and check this out. You know what sure. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we did that. And then Dell Diamond Stadium, the barn, the cemetery. And then this was, this was awesome. And this is what I spoke about in the last podcast with Danny Johnson. I know that you've gotten that feeling where it's almost, it's, it's, it's surreal. It's, I can't explain it. You know the feeling. Danny Johnson sure knows the feeling. Several people that do this stuff know the feeling. Now, that feeling, the, 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 the spot where I got the, the, that feeling the most originally was when I was on Alfred Lane in New Rochelle, and I'm looking across the street at the two houses, and I could picture Ray Liotta walking down the driveway, crossing the street, and then pistol whipping the guy in the other driveway. I stood there for a while, like, I can't believe I'm standing here. And it's just a quiet street. People live there. But I'm like, like, where's Martin Scorsese at right now? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That was, that was top until I was bummed because the next spot, was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house from the original movie, which they cut up into seven pieces and moved it from one town to Kingsland, where it's now standing. They put this house back together, dude, literally exactly the way it is. I'm talking about the trim on windows in random rooms the siding, the, the lattice work, the, I mean, everything, color scheme, everything, except obviously it's clean, but it's now a restaurant called the Grand Central Cafe. The only two differences is they put an extension on it where they have like an indoor bar and an outside patio. And the kitchen in the original house is now an actual functioning kitchen for a restaurant. Other than that, the house is exact. Now, when we Googled this, this was on Sunday. They close at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. 
it was there was no way we were getting there by two. So I was bummed. But I'm like, we have to go there anyway. I'll get all the outside shots I can get and chalk it up to like a half a loss. Even though everything so far, we're getting great spots. We're going inside places. We didn't expect it. All that. All right. If we don't go inside this, no big deal. A little disappointed, but no big deal. So I'm outside. Me and Nikki are outside and we're taking the pictures and we hear a couple of people around the side of the restaurant. So I'm like, I got to go and see who this is. So I go and it's two guys, probably in their 20s, early 30s, who work in the restaurant. Maybe they're bartenders, whatever they do. And they're sitting outside on the outdoor patio after work, having a couple of beers and smoking cigarettes. So I walk over to them. They're like, as soon as, they, as soon as we turn around, they see us. They're like, hey, what's up, guys? I'm like, hey, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. So I do the same old, you know, the same old spiel. You know, we're here, this and that. Next thing you know, the owner, his name was Barry, and his wife, who owned the, who owned the place, come outside. And I start talking with them. And he's like, yeah, dude, you want to take pictures? Go right ahead. So I'm like... I'm thinking, all right, I want to go there originally and go there and eat a bloody steak in the, in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house. Like, that was my intention, if I was hungry or not, you know? And I'm like, all right, and I'm also thinking, all right, there's going to be people there. There's going to be people, people in the way of my shots, this and that. Don't know if I'm going to be able to go all over the place. The place is closed. This guy gives us free run. Now... Amazing. What maybe I just got chills again, and I've spoken about this on the Danny episode, and I've spoken about it to coworkers and other people, and every time I get to this part, I get the chill because for me it was surreal. Now I'm standing in the bar that not is not a part of the original house, and I'm talking with the owners. They're like, "Yeah, let's go." So I walk through a door, and it's like a small little corridor. I make a right. And then I make a left. And as soon as I make that quick little left, I'm standing there and I see, it took me three seconds to really gather it in my head. Standing there and I was just like, there's, there's no way. Like there's no way right now. And I look at the owner and I'm like, am I standing where I think I'm standing, man? And he's like, and he starts laughing. Big guy, big fat guy, hilarious, sweet out of a guy. And he looks at me, he laughs, he's like, yeah, man. I was like, holy shit. And I look at Nikki, I'm like, how, how? And I'm looking and, my, and ex where I'm standing, this was my first time in this house, not through the front door, not through anything. The first time I'm actually in the actual house, aside from the bar, which is not the original house, I'm standing exactly where Gunnar Hansen, Leatherface, where you see him for the first time in the movie, he raises up a mallet and he cracks this guy Kirk in the head. And then he hits him again and he pulls him and he slams the metal door. Bong! And it's an iconic scene in in movies period and i'm standing exactly facing the same direction right where leatherface stood <laughs> and i'm just like how is this happening right now like this is insane to me and and i turn around and nikki sees it she goes oh my god she like turns around and walks away she can't believe it either because that was the first movie that she ever seen in the movie theater her mother brought her to the movies when she was like four years old and she was like four like hiding underneath like a blanket yeah, watching yeah. the texas chainsaw massacre so for her this it was a crazy moment too yeah but he's walking with me and he's like yeah this is the room where the chicken was in the in the bird cage and this and this and and this was this room, and I'm like, and this is the, this was the main room where the dinner scene is, and they have Sally tied up, and they're mocking her, and I'm standing there, and I'm just like, and I'm, and I'm looking at my shots that I have of the movie, and I'm looking at the moldings around the doors, and I'm like, it's exact, like everything. They cut this house up and put it back together, like it was probably like a, like it was like a pop up, like it folded up or something like that. That's how perfect it was. Crazy, dude. So that, that right there, that right now, 
holds the title of that. How am I here right now? I can't believe it. That's yeah. great. I, I know like, I have to start thinking about and maybe even writing down uh, a list because, you know, you and I and Danny, uh, we're getting to the point where there's it's easy to sort of forget uh, individual places that you've been and some of the really amazing details or nuances of, of the story. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to forget the fat guy that was laughing there with you. And, and Oh and no. Was, and and the oh. best, yeah. And the best part about it after we, I mean, we were walking around for like an hour, dude, I'm upstairs in the attic where the grandfather was sitting and they actually have like a, like a dummy of the grandfather sitting up there and, and I'm walking all over and he's explaining to me like, yeah, well, in the movie, if you're looking at the, if you're watching the movie, the door in the background is even with the staircase from the front door. But in real life, it's offset because that actual door was a movie prop. So it lined up perfect for the shot. And he was like, this was a false wall over here. Yeah, so he, yeah, yeah. You know, so he's telling me and it all makes sense. I'm like, yo, this is so crazy, man. Like, yeah, awesome. I'm learning about the, the I, 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 again, I don't want to make this about me at all, but I saw the, um, I, I did the Silence of the Lamb spots out in Pittsburgh a, a month or two ago, and uh, I, I was in the right spot, and I was like, there should be an elevator here, and there's no elevator, and uh, I asked somebody, I was like, what's going on, and they're like, oh, well, they built a false facade of the elevator because they wanted to shoot it in this, with the marble floor and the columns, and it was the perfect backdrop. Right. So when, you look, when you're looking at, at uh, out as if you're in the elevator, that's the spot that they wanted. And so they just built a fake front and they built fake elevator door and an elevator box. And then they could light it and film it however they wanted. So yeah. there's been a few instances where I've realized that there's there's um, some, I guess, Hollywood magic going on where they sure. built a temporary set in a in a, you know, a permanent yeah. place. Yeah, man. So that right there, that and as we were leaving, they were they, they, the owners were like, "Thank you for visiting us. Thank you for visiting Texas." Mm. I'm like, I didn't even buy, I didn't buy a meal. Like, I would have sat there and ate like an animal. I don't drink, but I would have got something from the bar, whatever Shirley Temple. I don't know, but I didn't. We didn't buy anything. They were closed, and they were like, "Thank you for coming here, and thank you for visiting wow. Texas." That's just great. Like, That's just so cool. Like, cool. give us free run, and then you're thanking me. Like, dude, like, I don't even know what to do with myself right now. I can't thank you enough, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's just crazy. That's how, yeah, that's how it happens sometimes, too. And you you might even have a stereotype or a preconceived notion about how people are going to be. And, and they, a lot of times, have a preconceived notion about how you're going to be. Yeah. Based on how you're dressed or how you talk. Yeah. And then you scratch the surface a little bit and people are cool. Yeah, it's just cool. And then from there, from there, I met up with my old drill instructor from 25 years ago from the Air Force. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, it's so crazy. My old drill instructor. It's, it's so crazy that I'm f legit friends with my drill instructor from Air Force boot camp in 1996. So we all we went to a big Mexican restaurant, him, his wife, his son, me, and Nikki. It was awesome. So we capped it off there. And then right from there, we drove up and we checked into a hotel in Waco, Texas. Oh, yeah. Wow. Dude. See, we go from Gilbert Grape to Fear the Walking Dead to Machete to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, sniper shootings to Waco. Um, another thing i woke we woke up early everything with everything was super late going to bed get up early out go um this was a monday i know that they were close they closed on sundays and mondays the branch davidian compound is now called the branch it's the mount Carmel memorial center but there are actual people that still live there um there there are survivors of the waco siege that still live there. Um, so, yes, um, Kevin Bednars, who is a Delta Bravo guy, um, he was actually there about a month before we got there, and he met a pastor there, and he told me that pastor's name. So that kind of helped me. Um, so we go there. Now, dude, as, I'm, as we're driving down the road, it's, uh, it's called... Double E Ranch Road 
in Waco. We're driving down this road for like four miles and there is nothing, flat nothing. All I picture is cops, ATF, tanks, FBI, all this stuff in 1993 being on these roads. Mm -hmm. um, we go, we pull up in front of the gate. The gate is actually a little bit open. There was no way I was stepping onto this compound. There are signs that literally say, once you step onto this property, we are not responsible for you, your mm -hmm. well-being, your vehicle, your children, your pets, your belongings, nothing. So I'm like, well, that's a deterrent, you know? Yeah, awesome. um, so, but once again, just like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house and stuff like that, I was like, it would really stink if we didn't gain access to this place. So me being me, there's like a five and a half, maybe six foot brick wall. And I climb up and I look over the wall and I see way in the distance, they rebuilt a small church on the actual original concrete slab Wait, of, so of, the, of the original compound, right? Mm -hmm. So I look and it's way far in the distance and I see a little red SUV of sorts parked next to the church. So I'm like, there's somebody here. So I, my big Brooklyn mouth comes into play and helps me, right? So I stand, I'm standing on top of the wall <laughs> and I'm like, hello, I'm screaming hello. Yeah across the branch Davidian compound, dude. So I'm like, nothing. There's no movement. There's nothing. I'm like, God, maybe they don't hear me. But you can hear anything for miles. Yeah. So I wait like 10 minutes and I yell again. Nothing. And then a couple minutes later, I see somebody walking, not from the church, but the opposite way towards the church. I see him and I yell again. And he goes into the church. I'm like, maybe he just doesn't hear me. I don't know. Sound is being doing weird stuff. I don't know. But he comes back out of the church because he went in there to get his truck keys. So he gets into the truck. And I see him get in the truck. And I look over at Nikki. I'm like, don't know what's going to happen, but, yeah. it, but here we go. I don't right. know. Right? Oh, man. I don't know so, either. All right. So I see now. There's this truck coming down this long dirt road and there's dust being kicked up behind this. And I'm yeah. standing at the front gate of the Branch Davidians, bro. So I'm like, don't know what's going to happen, but all I know is I'm going to be really polite, you know, right. really right. polite. So he gets out and he gets out and he, he has like, there's a kid with him, like his 10 year old, I'm going to say about 10 year old boy. So I'm like, how are you? I'm like, I'm Jimmy Ferrari. I'm blah, blah, blah. And he introduced himself. His name is Pete. I'm like, yeah, um, you know, I just wanted to know if we'd be able to, you know, give you a donation, whatever, for the church, the memorial, um, just to walk around a little bit, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes, take a few pictures and we're out. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to linger around. We don't want to overstay our welcome. And I was like, you know, a friend of mine, my friend Kevin was here about three weeks ago and he mentioned um, a Mr. Charles Pace. And he's like, okay. I'm like, is there, you have like his number? I don't have his contact information. He's like, okay. He's like, what's your name again? I tell him. He's like, all right, I'll be back in a few minutes. I'll see if he'll, if he'll let you on. I'm like, okay. So he comes back a few minutes later. He's like, yeah, I spoke to Charles's wife. And they, they both said that you can come on to the compound. I'm like, oh, wow. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm like, what would you like us to do? He's like, oh, just follow me. The gates open up. I get back in the truck and we're following this guy back up that same long road. Now, all I'm thinking is, is fire and ATF and all yeah. this chaos. Yeah. So we drive up to the church, dude, and we walk into the church and um, we're talking with him for a little bit. And Kevin had gave me a little bit of uh, insight, for lack of a better word. And we're standing there and the side door to the church opens. And oh, wow. a guy in a wheelchair comes out on an auto, you know, you know, automatic wheelchair. He's driving around. Um, he has okay. one leg. His left leg is amputated from the knee down, and he is blind in one eye. 
And this is Pastor Charles Pace, who is David Koresh's replacement. Wow. Was he injured in the, in the siege? He wasn't injured in the siege. His eye, I believe, was, but his leg was not. Supposedly, it was a tractor accident. Don't know. That's yeah. what I heard. That's a Seinfeld episode right there. Yes, it is. So, <laughs> the um, yeah. So I'm like, how are you? He's like, how are you? And I shake his hand and he looks at me and he's like, are you here to do like an interview or a podcast? I'm like, no, I just, we just wanted to just look around and, you know, I wanted to respect the place and just take a few pictures. He's like, oh, because if you were doing a podcast, you, know, you can, if you want. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't have any equipment. I was like, I do do a podcast, but I don't have my equipment. And I wasn't going to do an impromptu yeah. on my phone. What am I, I, I can't believe that I'm even standing here. What am I going to yeah. say? You know what I mean? Right. Right. So, dude, we had about an hour-long conversation standing in this church. I'm looking to my right, and they rebuilt the stage where David Koresh was standing there playing guitar. Um. Standing there talking with this guy, and we weren't talking about anything about religion or anything like that. He was talking about what was really going on there, what the media says, what's true about the media, what's oh, not yeah. true about the media. Yeah, dude. Um, some of it is very, very believable. Some of it's definitely a little bit wacky. Yeah. Um, I won't get into all that right now because I'll tell you that'll be two hours. Um, right. But I'm st the entire time I'm listening to this guy in the back of my head, I'm like, how am I standing here? How am I talking to David Koresh's, of, of, of all people, David Koresh's replacement on the original concrete slab of the Branch Davidian compound? That's wild. Wild. So we go outside and he shows the, the actual original pool is still there. And it's an in-ground pool that's made out of concrete. He pointed out. On the inside wall, there's a ring of like gray and black. And he's like, do you know what that is? I'm like, no, I don't know what that is. He's like, well, that's embedded into the concrete. It won't come out. I'm like, well, what is it? He's like, that's ash. Oh, wow. It's ash. And everything burning. And everything. everything burning. And then he showed us as these concrete steps, like the, the pool wasn't even full. It was like a quarter of the way full of little green, nasty water. And then... He showed us there's these concrete steps that are going from the corner into the pool. And he's like, it's very faded because of the years and whatever. And it was the second time I saw initials inside of concrete. And it's a DK 92. David Koresh 92's autograph in the concrete leading into the pool. Was like, that the same year as uh, Gilbert Grape? Was it both 92? No, 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 no. No, it was, uh, nine, I think, 90, what, 90 or 91, I think. Okay. It okay. wasn't the same year. But okay. I, I looked at it, it said DK92, and I was like, wow, this was less than a year left for him to be alive. Yeah, what a 93 crazy. 93 that went down. I'm just like, yeah, this is crazy. Yeah, and along the way, in each little spot, I pick a little piece of the place, like a, like a piece of concrete or a little piece of wood of like siding from a place. Nothing, I'm not damaging or anything. Like something conspicuous, right. just to know. Right. And then, uh, yeah, dude. So that Waco experience, and then we, we, they were like, he was like, yeah, walk around as long as you want, no problem. And he was super nice. It was very odd and very creepy, but he was super nice and accommodating. He didn't mind that we were there at all. And we went about our way, and then we eventually we just drove out, and we were on to the next spot. Like, did, you ever get a chance, did you ever get a chance to go to the museum in, in Washington, D.C.? It was called the Newseum, N-E-W-S no. Museum. You know, just it was News Museum. No. And it was uh, one of the few museums in D.C. that was for profit. And um, it's not there anymore, probably because of that, because all the other museums in D.C. are free. Uh, cause they're national museums, but it was a really cool spot for, for people like us because it had artifacts from everything from nine 11, from Waco. They have, they had the cabin that the Unabomber bomber lived in. Really? They, actually, they actually took it there and put it on display. They really? had like Richard Reed shoe bomb, all, all like wow. all of this stuff. It, like really 
they had um Johnny uh what's his name not John um the guy from uh what's the what's the uh, Johnny Depp mob movie with Al Pacino Oh Donnie Brasco Donnie Brasco they had his his um I his fake ID and really? his real ID yeah, and it was it was it was really a great museum, and it's a shame it's not there anymore. But I remember they had a whole exhibit about Waco as well. So not wow. to steal any of your thunder, but I just wanted to tie into the Waco thing because taking things like I don't generally do that, but I understand that if it's like something inconspicuous or like you know paint chip here, or yeah, like yeah, here, I like, took I took a little piece of the original slab of the compound. I took a little piece of the ash ring in the pool. And when I was looking around, dude, it was kind of like in the grass. It was kind of buried like underneath the slab. And it was like this small, it's like, it's probably about three inches by two inches. I don't know what, what it was, but it's like a charred, burnt up piece of metal. Really? I don't know if it's, it could it could very well be a piece of the actual compound. Sure, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff there. That's yeah, like from, I'm sure they didn't clean everything from top to bottom. No, it's it was yeah. very very. That's a, that's a really like really strange and uh, fascinating story about government and religion and. Yeah, it's, it's, this this whole this whole road trip was like chock full of how are we here right now? Like these huge moments in history and even like, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre House, like for me was crazy. Like this whole road trip was like that. It was, yeah. it couldn't have went better as far as experience with, with the places we went, you know? So like after, after Waco, which was like jarring, like we were just like stay, sitting there, like how, how did that happen? Like, we just did that, like very strange. Yeah. Then we, we started to head north because um, our next state was up to Oklahoma. Um, I was looking along at the route and I was like, I would like to hit spots that aren't so out of the way for time, but I would like to hit as many spots as possible. Like, like he was saying, no matter if I'm the biggest fan or not, but it was very cool. In Waxahachie, Texas was the house where... Sybil Shepard lived when she played Bonnie in the 1967 Bonnie and Clyde with, with, with um, William Bate, with uh, Warren Beatty. So it was her house. I got like three shots of that. House was a little bit different. There was like an extra porch that was made, but the siding was different, but, but it, was this, it was new siding, but it was the same pattern. But you could see it was the exact same house. Yeah. So we did that on our way up to... That's when we went to that famous picture on West Neely Street in Dallas of Lee Harvey Oswald in the backyard holding the rifle. Dude, I've been there. And... Yeah, um, I took a piece. I took a, I took a nail out of that wooden fence. Really? Yeah. Did you, go, did you actually go into the yard or did you take a picture from the fence? No, I went inside that yard. Did you? Yeah. yeah, we didn't. I I actually that place gave me the creeps, man. We got out of there pretty fast. I was I, hanging out. I took a picture over the fence. I hit my camera a couple times, and I was yeah. like, probably because when we walked up the top the top porch, the door was kind of half open. Mm. It looked it looked ominous. It looked yeah, bad. Nah, I walked right back in there like I lived there. I didn't give a shit. I'm taking all sorts of pictures, making sure that when I mash that the steps are at the right angle on the left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. I took a little piece of wood off of a, off, it was already like splintered. So I took like a, it's probably like the size of like a lollipop stick of that fence. And I pulled the nail out. There was a missing board and there was a nail sticking out. So I pulled the nail out. Yeah. So I think one of the reasons that place is so creepy to me is well, one, it's such a famous place Yeah. Uh, with that picture and that picture is so eerie, yeah. but also because they've kept it up so nice because it's been in movies Sure. It looks probably the exact same as it did. Yeah. Took that picture. Yeah. And it's you know, almost sixty years later, or yeah. it is sixty years later. Yeah. It's, yeah. Next and then later. we 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 popped over to the rooming house where Oswald stayed. It wasn't the place where he stayed the night before the the assassination, but we popped in there, and yeah, I knew we needed an appointment, so I rang the doorbell. This is an old lady who knew. 
Oswald, when he stayed there, she was like 12 years old when he was there wow. and remembers him. So we rang the doorbell and she's like, yeah, you need an appointment. I was like, okay. I was like, can you do sometime today? She was like, yeah, I can do like four or five o'clock. I'm like, okay. It was like maybe one o'clock or something like that. I'm like, okay, that's perfect. Because we went over to Dealey Plaza and we went to Dealey Plaza and that was in and of itself was also surreal. Like I grew up just like everybody of our generation watching the Zapruder film and yeah. the movies and all the documentaries. And we've seen it a million times, but to stand there and realize in reality, how small that little area is. Mm -hmm. I was just like, yo, yeah. Like, what are we doing here again? You know, it was 113 degrees that day in Dallas. And I was running around like, like it was nothing. Um, I stood behind a lot of people would know a lot of some people don't that there's actually three X's in the middle of the street, one for the missed shot, one for the first hit. And then there's the X, the, the fatal back to the left shot, um, which I don't see how anybody could think other than that there was a shot from the grassy knoll. Um, I stood behind that grassy knoll fence looking at that X in the street and it's so close. I'm yeah. like, really this close, crazy. Yeah. And that whole thing was just surreal. I looked at Nikki, we sat on the steps, like, right. There's a couple of steps that lead up to the grassy knoll concrete steps. And we sat there for a few minutes, just like looking, just quiet, like just taking in that whole thing. Um, yeah. A couple of, when I was there, I've been there twice and, uh, uh, the, the second time was when I really went in with the Delta Bravo stuff. And uh, that's that place really gives me that feeling of, uh, you know, that's a history that I wasn't alive for. But I feel yeah. like because I've watched so many documentaries and so many films and read so many books about it. I'm a bit of a, I guess, a buff about the assassination. And me too. Uh, oh, I have me. all kinds of different theories. They don't all make sense. Some of them make sense one day and then they don't be. Uh, yeah. Next. I don't know if you had a chance to go to the sixth floor museum. I didn't. But, they, they were closed or you needed an appointment or something, but that was okay. Like, like I know that you were able to go up there, but it was like, if we get up there, okay. If not, like, that's cool too, because there was so much, you know what I mean? It's also a matter of, we have to really pick and choose our battles here. You know what also, I mean? Also, uh, as, a, as a purist and somebody who wants to get the right angle, you can't um, because the corner where the so-called sniper nest is, is glassed off. And they, it's, it's, you can't look out. You can look out the next window and kind right. of imagine, which is pretty, pretty cool too. But you can't look out the exact window. Right. Um, but back to the... Back to the mashups and the spots, um, you know, you got, looks like you did um, uh, the, what's her name? The Mary Mormon shot from, uh, yes. from behind. And yes. I, when I was there, I, I did my own Zapruder film. Like I hopped up on the, the block and I nice. basically took the same angle and, and panned the same way he did. Yeah. And I've watched that so many times and it's, uh, it's, that's a really a uh, strange place to visit. And like you said, it's small. It's a very contained space. And yeah. you have to wonder why they took that route where they slowed down and they made the turn and then sure. they slowed down again. And yeah. yeah. And one of the one of the first things I thought, besides how close that that X is, that back to the left fatal shot, standing behind that fence on the grassy knoll, I swear the one of the first things I thought of, whoever fired this shot what a pair of balls because it's so close and there's people everywhere. Like you have to have a backbone like crazy to yeah. do that. And yeah, yeah. it's the president. He's a beloved president. You're so close. You, I was just like, I was mind blown standing behind that fence. And then here yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I know it, it just that being in that, having that perspective, it's kind of like the, flagpole in at University of Texas that you you know you looked up and you saw the same perspective of the woman who was scared yeah being in, in a, the alleged position of a third uh shooter 
and you're like, this is what it looked like. I, oh, I can totally believe it. Cause it's yeah. so, like you said, it's so close. Yeah. And it matches up with all of the, all of the action that happened. Yeah. And what, ha and what happened was, of course, I want to try to get a little tiny, like splinter of wood from the fence, right? A little piece. So I didn't do it on purpose. I, I swear I really didn't. So I'm like, okay. So it, it was all, it was already like separated, like from this piece of wood. So I'm like, okay, I'll just take a little piece. So I go to take it and like, dude, like an 18 inch piece of the fence just cracks off. And like, it's like, wow. I'm like, oh shit. Like I didn't mean to do that. So I'm like, all right, well now I, I broke it. I got to take, it. I'm not going to throw it away. So there I am. Once we were leaving there, I slide it down. I have shorts on. I slide it down my left leg and I'm walking through Dealey Plaza with like, a stiff leg like I got a limp with a piece of the fence with the grassy knoll in my pants yeah. like, what the hell man so yeah I have a piece of the grassy knoll fence which is nuts also I yeah I I um I had a good time in Dallas because I was there when my wife had she had business and I just tagged along and thought all right well she's doing her conference I'll I'll run around with our rental car and that's what I did and uh, uh, it was, was kind of cool because I knew I wanted to go to Dealey Plaza again. And, but then I went down the rabbit hole and I found that there was uh, films that I never knew were filmed in Dallas. Um, and the one that I think I had the most fun with was Born on the 4th of July. Yes. Uh, which is supposed to be Massapequa, Long Island, but it's Dallas, Texas. And who knew, Weird. right? Yeah. And so I found like, I found all these spots, the house where they lived in the movie, it looks exactly the same. It's just painted a different color. Yeah. Um, where they're where they have the parade at the beginning of the movie where he's kid where they're when they're kids and there's sparklers and and he's uh you know he's just a kid with a with a mickey mantle baseball hat on yeah all of it's still there it's just in different um and and the, the one that i couldn't believe i did if i can go on about this just a sure. second, is um and this is kind of what happened to you you start reading and figuring out oh about 30 miles away, maybe maybe more, uh, there's a little town called Venus, Texas. Okay. And um, in the movie, he, the guy he kills, Ron Kovic, uh, kills with friendly fire, is from Venus, Georgia. Wow. So I imagine that it was in Venus, Georgia. And then sure. you read a little bit and you find out that he gets out of the Trailways bus, or the Greyhound bus, and he wheels up to this thing and it says Venus Grocery on it. And sure oh. enough, I found that exact corner. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's this little town called Venus, Texas. And that building is still exactly the same. And then somebody a couple of weeks ago on Delta Bravo or one of the other um, groups posted a, I think it was Bonnie and Clyde, but was Jack Nicholson in a Bonnie and Clyde movie? Ever? Not that I'm aware of. Maybe it was Warren Beatty. But Probably Warren was, Beatty. Yeah, but it was in the same block. I'm like, I know that building. That's the Venus Grocery wow, on okay. the other end of it. So it's pretty cool when you start when you start realizing there's some overlap and they use these same vintage buildings for absolutely different stories. Yeah. Um, but I was I was happy that I went out of my way to go to this little town, and uh, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't on the way anywhere. I I had to go out of town and drive straight back. Yeah. But um, I got this really cool spot of uh, born on the fourth of July. That's right? awesome. Yeah, never I, be we, there again. We wound we wound up getting like bonus things with information from people. Like after we left Dealey Plaza, we went back to the rooming house to speak with this woman. Her name is Miss Pat, and oh, right. and we sat down, and her house is still the same on the inside from from the sixties. And there's original newspapers of when Kennedy was killed and all different stuff. And we're sitting down on this, and she has like green shag carpet, dude. And like these big seventies couches and we're talking with her and she has her own theories and she, she doesn't think Oswald was the only shooter and this mm -hmm. and that. And we, she has like, we, we walked into this little tiny little area that served as, as Oswald's bedroom mm -hmm. and his bed is in there. And oh, the original wardrobe where he hung his stuff is still in yeah. there. Yeah, and, you get to um, Alvin, Texas. No, uh, I think it's Alvin. No, nope. 
anyway, it's where Ruth Payne lived with with his wife. Um, gosh, what's her name? I forget all of a sudden. But uh, I, he either stayed there the night before. That's where he got the gun, allegedly, right. from the garage. And they've turned that little residential home into a museum now. There's a plaque outside. That's awesome. Uh, there's a, yeah, um, it's it is. It's pretty it's pretty crazy. But for the same reason, you know, you 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 kind of can picture sure. him getting the rifle or storing it in there in a rolled up carpet, all of the yeah, little details all that that stuff. You and, when you start doing the research. Yeah. And Miss Pat told us that she was like, well, if you, cause we told her what we were doing and she was like, well, if you want another location, like a mile and a half up the road is the Texas theater where Oswald was arrested. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So we went right there because of Miss Pat. It wasn't on our list. We we're like, okay. So we went and we hit that. Mm. Um, yeah, so like it, all of this stuff, and this is all this is day three, like crazy, you know. And then yeah, that, you can actually do the whole, like you can say, all right, he got off the bus here. This is where he alleged yes. he shot Tippett. I I got that spot, and then right. um, I drove past the, the boarding house where you're talking about. Yeah, and then I went to the Texas Theater also, and all that. It's weird. That really feels like time travel to me. Yeah. That analogy, but so much of it, even all of Oak Cliff, feels like you're going back to the 1960s. Absolutely, dude. It's, it's it's very little has changed there. Yeah, and then once we left there, we we had we headed straight up to Oklahoma City. Mm. We went to Wyndham Grand at Oklahoma City. We checked in, and I got that hotel on purpose. It's literally two and a half blocks from the Oklahoma City bombing memorial, mm. which happened two years to the day after wake up. It was all connected, right? It was, he, it was his, all connected. Uh, Timothy McVeigh was there watching the siege go down. Oh, is that right? Yes. Wow. So we went there and I wanted to see it twice because at night, the way it's lit up, it's beautiful. Like that memorial, Beautiful is a terrible word, I guess, under the right. circumstances, but the way it's put together and the thoughtfulness behind it and the cleanliness of it is amazing. Like, Isn't it what, like chairs or something? Is it chairs? Yeah, there's there's um there's a thing called the survivor tree, which survived it got blown like half apart in the blast, but then it came back and it's still standing. Um, and then where the Murrah building actually stood is where there's all the chairs okay. that represents each person who were killed in that office building. And at night, all the chairs are lit up Oh wow! and there's smaller chairs for the children. Oh God. Jeez. Yeah. And then in between that, right after that, there's this reflective, there's a reflection pool, but it's only like a half inch deep. It's just black and which is a layer of water. And on one side of it, it says 901. And then on the other side, it says 903. Because 901 was when everything was still okay. 902 is when the building blew. 903 was when they started to get back to normal and start to heal. That's the, sim the symbolism of these the gates of time. Okay. Wow. And, and it, the way it, the symbolism and how it's put up is beautiful, dude. Mm -hmm. um, it's a super heavy place. Mm -hmm. The only part of, they actually left one small portion of a support wall of the Murrah building is still there. Um, so yeah, I wanted to see it at night. So we were there. It was like 1.30 in the morning. We're walking around Oklahoma City. And I got to tell you, I get oh, whoever is, if you happen to be listening or watching from Oklahoma City, I give you all the props in the world. Because that city is pristine, dude. Yeah. See, the sidewalks look like, like the tan brick pavers somebody would have in their backyard. Wow. There is no gum in the street. There's no, on the corner, there's garbage cans, 
with thin white plastic bags lining them with no garbage in it. There wow. is nothing in the streets. There was nobody around. It was me and Nikki were walking around. It was super quiet and pristine. I've never seen a city. We were in the middle of Oklahoma City. Never seen a city anywhere close to being that clean. Mm. And that just shows it's not it's not bumper sticker lingo. It's not an empty slogan. It's like they have pride in their city and it right. shows because like, yeah, we have to live here. This place is immaculate, dude. Wow. Immaculate. That's besides the memorial. That's what I take away from Oklahoma City. Pristine cleanliness. Amazing, yeah. dude. It was it was I can't stress how much I appreciated how amazingly clean this place was. I couldn't believe it. That's great. For a fully functional city. Yeah. Immaculate. Not even a gum wrapper, dude. Nothing. Not a not a tissue blowing down the street. Nothing. Wow. Awesome. So then the, the, we went to the hotel the first thing in the morning. We went back during the day so I could get my shots of the horrible thing that happened there. Um, and then we went to... Grave Creek Cemetery in Hitchita, Oklahoma. Oh, I this, think I know. this was really a cool moment, man. Like, we're coming off of craziness like Dealey Plaza and Oswald and Waco and Oklahoma City. It's like all this horrible history. And then we go to the place, the first place that we had no cell phone service. We lost all cell phone service. We're driving down this gravel road in the middle of nowhere, Native American country. And we found it's on an, a small, tiny little Indian burial ground at the Grave Creek Native American Cemetery. And I paid my respects to Will Sampson. Now, if people don't know who Will Sampson is, if you've ever seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or The Outlaw Josie Wales or Poltergeist 2 or a million other movies with cowboys and Indians, Will Sampson in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest played Chief. He's the big, tall Native American guy. And I went to his grave and I stood there for a minute like this is, I never in a million years ever thought I would be standing at this guy's grave. And I bought it about two weeks, three weeks before the road trip. I had it all planned out and I had it in my pocket and I went there and I left a pack of juicy fruit on his tombstone because in one flew over the cuckoo's nest, he literally says four words. He says, thank you. After Jack Nicholson, Randall Patrick McMurphy hands him a piece of juicy fruit and he says, thank you. And he puts it in his mouth and he chews and he goes, ah, juicy fruit. And that's all he says in that whole movie. And I just think it's really cool that I got the opportunity to leave chief a pack of juicy fruit gum on his tombstone. That's incredible. Did you that was just a cool thing, man. Yeah. And I know you 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 go to quite a few grave sites. That's something I, I haven't gotten into a whole lot. But um, is that something that you find on is it findagrave.com or something? Yeah, like it's that? find a grave. Yeah, mostly find a grave. If, if you're into cemeteries and you want to look up famous people, find a grave is your spot. Sometimes it'll just say the cemetery and it won't say a plot number or anything. Sometimes yeah. it, sometimes. Like, for instance, like if you want to visit Lucky Luciano, you go to find the grave and you type in his name, it'll say view map. And somebody actually, if you click maps, it'll open up and it will dual drive right to his mausoleum. Yeah, yeah. Certain yeah. people are super accurate. Some people you have to look around. I found H.H. H. Holmes, the first oh, ever, yeah. quote unquote, he has an unmarked grave. I found it. Wow. I found it because of tombstones in the area surrounding it, and oh, yeah. But, I think, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, and I would imagine that the the Native American um, uh, cemetery would be harder to find. Or, yeah, it's not. It, the actual cemetery 
is not even on the map. Yeah. The, the Grave Creek Church is. Now, gearing up for this road trip, I tried to find, I, it said Will Sampson was buried Grave Creek Cemetery, but I can't find Grave Creek Cemetery anywhere. But I can find Grave Creek Church. Mm-hmm. So they have like a Facebook page, like 100 people like it, or whatever, but there's a phone number. So I'm like, I'm at work one day on lunch break. I'm like, I'm going to call this place. Some lady answers the phone. I'm like, hi, how are you? She's like, hi, Oklahoma accent. And I'm like, this might be a little bit strange, but I introduced myself. I'm from New York City. I'm planning a road trip, blah, blah, blah. And I was wondering if I would be able to pay my respects to Will Sampson. And she was like, oh, okay. I was like, yeah, I I don't know. Is it like across the street? She's like, oh, no, no. She's like, it's a road. We're in the boonies. There ain't no streets. I'm like, well, I stand corrected. I'm just a city guy calling a number. I have no idea who I'm speaking to. So she goes, well, I'm Will Sampson's niece. No way. Yeah. And her name was Patty. And I'm like, really? She's like, yes. I'm like, I'm like, this is incredible. And I'm talking with her and I said something, I don't remember what I said, but she laughed. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm just a I'm just a city guy. I don't know. She's like, well, you know, you seem to be a very considerate city guy because nobody ever really calls to see if they can pay respects. They just usually come there and they're filming stuff and next thing you know, you know. So I'm like, yeah, well, I'm not from there. I don't know how you operate. I just want to respect yeah. how it is, you know? And She's like, yeah. She was like, well, you know, when you come and she was like, what's the date? I'm like, well, that's um, Tuesday, July 19th. She's like, well, you have my phone number now and you call me up and maybe we can pay respects to my uncle together. And I'm like, that would be, that would be incredible. Like, thank you so much. But then once we got there, nobody was in the church. And even if I wanted to call, I had no cell phone service. Oh, right. And no service. That's so really great, though. Yeah, I, I still have, have it in my that. phone, and I, I kept her in my phone. It's like Chief's niece I have her as, or something like that. Yeah. Like a hip-hop name, yeah. Yeah, so that was super cool. And then right from there, we got out of there, and we went to the headquarters. Outside his house, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hit up Danny Boy as soon as we got to the Airbnb, the Greaser hideout. I'm like, yo, man, I'm here. He's like, oh. I'll meet you in 10 minutes outside the Greaser hideout. Sounds good. He pulls up. I laughed because I forgot that his license plate says two bit. <laughs> so he comes whipping around the corner in his big ass truck and he doesn't even get out of the truck. He just, I thought he was going to get out and give me a pound. What's going on, bro? Blah, blah, blah. No, he, he, he puts his passenger side window down. He's like, yo, hop on in, man. Welcome to Tulsa. Let's go hit spots. I'm like, oh, that's Oh, that's exactly what you want to hear, right? Yeah, so I'm like, yeah. I'm in. So I jump in. Nikki jumps in the back, and we just go. And he's bringing me to spots that I didn't have or, or had any intentions of the outsiders to even hit, you know? So he brings us to where the Dairy Queen used to be, and then he brings me to the Circle Cinema, and then he brings me to the, to the to Twin Admiral drive through And then he's like, all right, I got to get in. For the first stop was the DX. We went to the DX and then we go through the buildings and that was the 52 pickup spot. And then he's like, you know, if you watch this part and then when they, when he, when they, when they chase the kids, it's a different location. Oh, really? And then he pointed it out. And now I will not, not see what he showed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like the hair is longer because he's filming rumble fish. This is that they called him back oh, yeah. to do that scene. And it's a different spot. So he brought me to the second spot where they're running and chasing the 52 pickup kids. I got a brick from that building. I got a brick from the outside, the original outsider's house stoop that was in the backyard. Danny's like, yeah, have at it. So I grabbed the brick from there. He brought it. He's like, oh, I got to get gas. I'm like, all right. He's just whipping around Tulsa. So he's like, oh, by the way, this is the spot where you see Matt Dillon running out of after he knocks off the convenience store. This is the spot. I'm like, really? 
I'm like, all right. So I get out. I'm like, all right, you got to move your truck, Danny. You're in, you're in my shot. He laughs because he gets it. I'm like, you got to drive away, dude. You're in my shot and you're going to fuck up my mash. He's like, all right. So he moves out of my way. I take my shots. I got that. I had no idea I was going to get that. Um, all of these things that we bring, he brings us back to the outside of his house. And I get to see the brick that I bought. It was for me and my daughter, for my mother. And it's, it's laying right. there and, and we're inside the place and shout out to Monty McManus. He, he came and rang the doorbell while we were in there. I met him and, and that was a whirlwind because Danny was like, let's go. Boom, boom, boom. And we were just off and we were like, bang, bang, bang. And, and, and we were just hitting everything. And, and then I have to, I mean, hats off to Danny, man, for the foresight. And he showed us where Crutchfield Park was and where the rumble scene happened. And then we hit that on our own after Danny went to go do his thing, you know, afterwards. But I got to say, if anybody is in the area or wants to go there, you have to stay at the Greaser Hideout, man. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Dude, that, that place, crazy. that was another time I had a moment, bro. We walk in there and it sleeps like seven people if you want. It was just me and Nikki. There's two bedrooms, there's three beds, there's the there's like a the couches, there's a couch that opens up into a bed, there's a washer and dryer, there's a there's a wall of fame where like C. Thomas had there's a whole bunch of signatures on the wall. Everything, there's Delta Bravo stuff, there's Delta Bravo coasters, there's outsiders house stuff everywhere, throw pillows, everything. Stay gold neon in the bedroom that we slept, slept in. And later on, like we're walking, we, we go, I, I, I take a shot of Johnny's house and we turn the corner and everything is super close. And like right down the block, like the, the empty lot where the rumble happened. And now it's like a half empty lot because one house is there, but I know the exact field. And we turn the corner and there's Crutchfield Park. And this is where Johnny killed Bob. And this is where they get rolled up on. This is where this is where the monkey bars were. And and all of this is a Crutchfield Park sign. It's a different sign, but it's still in the same spot. And and then the opposite corner of Crutchfield Park is where Dally gets shot by the cops at the end. And all of this is just right here. And I'm like, this is incredible, dude. Like, this is so amazing. I can't believe I'm here. Like I said that so many times. We both said that. How are we here right now? Growing up on this movie. And I said it a million times. And in 92, when Jump Around came out, if you would have thought that I'd be legitimate friends with Danny Boy, who will will text like regular phone number to phone number about shit like not nothing of nothing even about house of pain or rap or anything like just about delta bravo stuff or things that we want to do together and as a team and this and that you would i would think that you were nuts if you thought if if i you know if you said that in 92 like like i say this all the time he's not even danny from house of pain anymore you know he's just he's danny you know what i mean and just super i mean humble best dude and we went back in and I'm laying down at night. It's late. And of course, I have to put the outsiders on the TV. Oh, that's great. And I'm laying in bed and my, my perspective is I'm laying in bed. And to my left, you look out the door and it's the other bedroom. And there's a bed there. And there's the outsider's house. It's like a throw blanket that's on there. And it says Stay Gold, the Outsiders House Museum. And in the same room, there's, there's the state gold neon sign. And I'm surrounded by outsider stuff. I'm literally across the street from the Curtis Brothers house. And I'm watching the outsiders. And as I'm watching it, God damn it, I hear the friggin' freight train go by. Oh, no way. The freight train. And, I'm just, and, and you hear it, Bob, and you hear the freight train go by. And I'm just like, how cool is this man yeah. like and i stood in that moment just focused on that train because when am i gonna i might fall asleep by the next time the train goes by mm -hmm. i don't know i might not hear that train again and where i was and i just took in that whole moment and i'm like this is possibly a once in a lifetime moment 
And I realized that in the moment, which I'm glad I did. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. And then it was just, I fell asleep. I woke up, we're in the greaser hideout. You know, we did a little load of laundry, which was cool from some clothes that we had from the road trip. We left the place like we weren't even there. You know, mm-hmm. total respect for everything. You know, this glass, you can cook in there if you want. I wasn't cooking a damn thing. Like I drank a glass of water and washed out the glass afterwards. I left everything the way we, we the way we walked in. Yeah. And Danny boy texts me like eight o'clock in the morning, like uh, an address. Yo, what's up? Come over. So we go and we're in this place called the uh, the Fastway, the Freeway Cafe, Fastway Freeway Cafe, and. We sit down and we're eating breakfast. It's me and Nikki and Danny and Danny's friend who taught him how to dive. And as we're recording this, Danny is in the Caribbean diving. And what was cool is that there was two rocks. Danny brought me two rocks. He left them on the table when we got there. And it just so happened that there were two rocks from the front yard of Walter White's house from the Breaking Bad house. Oh, wow. That's that fantastic. he gave me, that he gave wow. me. Like, you didn't have to do that, dude. Like, yeah. that's just cool, man. Yeah. And we were talking, and he was like, yeah, by the way, um, that corner booth over there, that's the booth where Tom Petty signed his first ever record deal. What? And I'm like, what? And they were cleaning it off. He's like, yo, get up. I'll go take your picture. So I went over. I sat there, and Danny took the picture. And that's the same table where Tom Petty signed his first record deal. That's amazing. I thought he was all about Florida. I thought he was like Gainesville, Florida. With to, to um, Shelter Records, which I learned this from Danny, who was Leon Russell's record label. Okay. And, and I need to back up because the same the day before, we were driving around and he stops. He's like, yo, you see this spot? I'm like, yeah. He's like, that is the church where Sam Kinison used to preach before he became a comedian. Oh my gosh, wow. So I'm like, really? What did that place look like? Was it still it's, a church? It's, it's abandoned. Oh, really? So I got out, I took that picture, and then he was like, yeah, he's like in, I don't remember the name of the, of the cemetery, but he's like, Leon Russell and Sam Kinison are both buried in Tulsa right here. So, really? right, yeah. So after... He took after we, we said our goodbyes and the snap, we talked about a few things, what we would like to see and do in the future as a team and you know, whatever. Pretty we cool. left yeah, we, yeah. we left and we left and then uh we went to go visit Sam Kinnison's grave. And I'm oh, like, this was a bonus, you know. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah, so Tulsa. Yeah. So so we visited his grave and then we left Tulsa and where was next, dude? Um well, we had Mr. Ed's grave, but we didn't do it. Because, the horse? Yeah, the, the horse. But that we, that we didn't do because we went to Johnny Cash's childhood home. Oh, they okay. were closed, but I didn't really mind if I Where went to that? or not. That is, in, that is in Dias, Arkansas. Oh, okay. So we're out of Oklahoma into Dias, Arkansas. Now, <laughs> I had watched this thing from like the somebody had posted it on YouTube. They uploaded something from the late 60s of Johnny Cash revisiting his childhood home from the 60s. Nice. So I took screenshots from that mm-hmm. that no one, I didn't see anyone mash. There was a, a family one, a couple of people have hit it. I did the same. But, um, it's the it one was, where he's looking, looking in the screen door. Yes, kind of that's a screenshot yeah. from the YouTube video that's from the 60s. That's great. And in that same video, the guy had said right next to the Dias Theater, which is a little historic little district, tiny little area, a couple of miles from Johnny Cash's boyhood home, there is a little rundown shack that a scene from the movie Walk the Line with Joaquin Phoenix, the Johnny Cash movie, was filmed in there that I believe, don't quote me on it, where the actual incident actually happened where Johnny Cash's brother was fatally injured with the saw and later died. Oh, wow. The scene depicting that from Walk the Line was also filmed in that same building. Hmm. 
now. That sounds right, because then they were trying to be authentic about it. Right. So what happens is, here's a little side thing of what happens on missions sometimes. Just like in Tulsa, because I was told that there's stray dogs running around Tulsa. Mm. And we've seen a few stray dogs walking around Crutchfield Park, and it's like, all right, there's stray dogs running around. I think Jimmy Cash had mentioned it on his episode. Yeah, I remember that story, yeah. right. So now we do his boyhood home, and I was like, okay, I want to get these shots of possibly inside this place, but it's run down, the ceiling is coming in, there's, it's boarded up. So now we get out, there's like this horseshoe. It's like, a, I guess you, if, if, to picture it, it's kind of like a wraparound driveway off of one road. It's like a little semicircle horseshoe of the Dias Theater, a couple little buildings and this other building. So now we, we, we park on the opposite side of this horseshoe. And we're walking around taking pictures. As soon as we get out of the car, we hear dogs barking. Now we're thinking, okay, it's probably in some distant house, in someone's backyard, probably chained up or in the cage or whatever. Don't know, whatever. Taking pictures. As I'm walking, I get closer to the building where this scene was shot in the movie. And I see two dogs running at top speed, you know when a dog runs really fast and they look like they're really low to the ground because that's how yeah. fast they're running? Right. Two dogs are running like that across the street. As soon as they run, I hear Nikki, Jim, they, there they are. That's it. I turn around and she's walking back to the truck. Now, she bought mace for this reason, for whatever, but of course the mace is still in the truck and not on her or on me. So she's walking back to the truck. I'm like, yeah, gee, thanks. Like she's leaving me for dead to get mauled by two straight dogs. She's out, right? I'm like, great. So I'm not thinking really anything. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, two dogs. So I turn back around to still walk towards the building, and they run behind this building from across the street behind this building, top speed, like on a mission, right? So okay. I'm walking, and then they both whip around the right-hand side of the building, and they, they run towards me and then stop short. Really? They, these two dogs, one wow. was a pit bull and one was some sort of a mix something. Now, I think Jerry Maguire, the little kid, dogs smell fear and blah, 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 <laughs> right? So I'm standing there and now I'm thinking in my head, this is bad, but I'm not showing any fear. Even though inside, I'm like, I'm about to get attacked and mauled in Dias, Arkansas by dogs. Great. <laughs> so I'm, I stop short and I stare back at them. I'm standing there and I just look them both in the face and they, they're looking at me. And it was almost comical because then they both looked at each other <laughs> and they look back up at me and I'm staring at them and they look back at each other and they walked away. Oh, my God, really? And then I'm like, don't run, because if I run, they're going to run after me. I back up. I walk towards the truck. I get in the truck. I'm like, pull around, because there's no way I'm leaving here now without my shot. I don't yeah. care. I'm not, I'm not going out like that. So I look. The coast is clear. They're like off in the woods somewhere. I get out real slow out of the car. And I look, and now I have nothing to go by because this place is all boarded up. I pull a piece, I put my flash on, because now it's getting dark out. And inside of this building is dark. It's an abandoned, empty building. So I pull like this plywood back, and I put my flash on. I blindly put my phone inside, and I take like five or six pictures. Yeah. And then yeah. I look, and now I can see what the inside of this shithole looks like. I'm like, Jesus Christ. And we get out of there. I was like, I think I might, because there's a window in the shot that I want to get. And I and what was, it? was this another Johnny Cash spot? What was this it? Is, this is the scene from, in, from Walk the Line. Oh, this is the one where he gets injured. Yes, yeah. but I think okay. they filmed the scene, and they left that building to rot. It's just wow. not in on itself. Really? And we got the hell out of there. Yeah. Right? Hoping I got the spot. So now, next spot was we checked into the guest house at Graceland in Memphis. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, Nikki's a huge Elvis fan. I'm an Elvis fan, not the biggest. I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, I'm the biggest. But let me tell you something. I'll just start off like this. Even if you're not an Elvis fan, if you go there, the mansion itself is a little overrated. But the museums on the grounds, dude, highly recommended wow. and super impressive. Like, I knew Elvis was like the guy, but I didn't know that he was like the guy like this. He, dude, that the, the mansion itself, I thought was going to be a lot bigger. It's really not that big. It's probably kind of dated too, right? It's it's the same. There's yellow formica kitchens. Yeah. There's yeah. it's old school. So I got a bunch of, the only thing I did not like, the only gripe I had about it is, and it's the only option, I got like the deluxe VIP package, this whole thing, but there's, the only option is for a guided tour. I do not like guided tours. I like to do my own thing, but that was the only option. So that's what I did. I felt, we both felt like we were kind of rushed I was there to get shots. There's people in my way. I'm with, we separated from our group. I think our tour guy was a little aggravated, didn't care. It's like, I'm not rushing and I'm taking pictures. Like all you people need to go into the jungle room area so I can get you out of it so I can get my angles. Like that's what I'm doing. You know what I right. mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But his museum. Is, was- is there just a million pictures of Elvis? At Graceland that you could match up? I mean, I would Oh, imagine. you just type in Elvis Graceland, you're going to get a, a million pictures. Yeah. But yeah. I tried to get some more obscure stuff. Like, there's a weird kind of grainy picture of Elvis diving off of his diving board. I got that. Yeah. Like, there's one on his horse in his backyard. Got that. Um, there's a lot of odd ones. There was one that I found where you could walk inside of his plane and... Yeah. I, as I was there, I Googled Elvis is playing blah, 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 and I found a picture of young Lisa Marie Presley sitting at the controls of that plane. And I oh, found that cool. picture. So I got up there and I saw the cockpit and I'm like, oh, snap. So I took a bunch of pictures and it came, the match came out beautiful. That was like a bonus on the spot. You know, it was really cool to walk through like Elvis's bed is in the plane, like all of these things, it was super, the, the museums with all of his gold records, all of his outfits, his jewelry, his, you know, all of this stuff. If you ever get a chance to go to Graceland, dude, just go. Especially if you're like a guided tour, then it's right up your alley. But it was awesome, dude. It was, it was really a cool experience. Um, and then we stayed in the, in, in the guest house. You open up the door. In the room, there's Elvis, everything Elvis is playing oh, really? at night from like 10 o'clock on, like down in the lobby, there's like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches because that was one of Elvis's things. Like it's yeah. all Elvis. It's super cool. Everyone was super professional. The concierge, all this stuff. It's it's super well done. It's a classy spot. There I am, hand tattoos, shorts, dirty from the day, you know, walking in, felt like a weirdo walking in, checking in there, but it was super cool. Graceland. That's amazing. Yeah, and Graceland. I'm not, I'm not a huge Elvis fan, but... Um, Me neither. But, dude, once you go there, I think once you go there, I think you can't help but not to become a little bit more of a fan. Yeah. Oh, I bet. No, I'm sure of that. And especially yeah. if it's well done. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, yeah. and it's because of the museum and, and rather than the actual house. That's Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then once we got out of there, it was about a six-hour drive. And we went to Johnny Cash's grave in Henderson Gardens in Henderson, Tennessee. That was at about 1.30 in the morning. And there's me and Nikki by cell phone flashlight really? walking around the cemetery trying to find Johnny Cash and June Carter's grave. And we oh found God. it. It's open 24-7. We're wet grass. We're just walking around with cell phones trying to find it. That's why the picture that I posted, it's at night. It was like 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. But we had to get it. And listen, it's at night. We didn't intend on it being at night, but we had to do it. And that's what we did. We visited him. 
Poof. And then we stayed. Then, then it was a long drive. It was about an eight hour drive. And then we wound up. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but no, no. We wound up in Moneta, Virginia. Okay. And the, originally, the next stop was supposed to be Arlington Cemetery. Yeah, yeah. But that was the only spot that I didn't have a hotel book because it was from Graceland to Johnny Cash's Cemetery was like three hours. But from there on was like a 10 and a half hour drive. So knowing from being the Graceland tour and all of that, I don't know how far we're going to get, how we're going to feel. So we wound up getting a spot somewhere not far from, uh, it was about five hours in after Johnny Cash's grave. We found some weird spot. It was like a red roof plus or something. I'm not even sure exactly what part of Virginia we were in. But it was like $85. It was clean. There was no bed bugs and there was a shower. That's all we wanted. That's all you need. Yeah. Yeah. So we get up and it was a bonus because of the all right, we were like, all right, no, no Arlington because they close at five and whatever. So let's look for spots around this area. Roanoke, Virginia was about eight miles away from where we stayed and it was the whole what about bob scene where mm-hmm. where bob wiley pulls into what was supposedly lake winnipesaukee new hampshire is actually monetta virginia and that place was crazy because it was abandoned when they filmed the movie and they just put a fresh coat of paint and they made it nice they filmed and they walked away and it just is crumbling in on itself. The whole thing. And it's weird because it's a beautiful area. And then the end of this block, it's called, what was it called? Santa Rita Drive. It's like a half of a block with like four buildings and they're all just collapsing in on itself. And then at the end of the block is a railroad and the opposite side of the railroad is all buildings just falling down on themselves. And it's just very strange that I watched a YouTube video of a guy who was at the filming location and said that once they built the railroad, it basically shut down this whole town oh, that was okay. over here. And, and it was, it just, it, it carried the whole town and then like four buildings on the opposite side of the tracks. And then everything is beautiful after that. It was very weird. I mm. wanted to go inside. But that was a spot where if I go inside, I'm probably falling through the floor. <laughs> so that I didn't want stray dogs, barbed wire fences, maybe a little trespassing, Waco compound. I'm not going in the what about Bob General Lake Winnipesaukee store because I might not come out. Right. So we got all of that. And then we had to kind of we uh we we did some some we called a few audibles. Um, a plan was to meet up with, with Kevin Bednaz at, um, at the Percival Eats or the Percival Pub in Percival, Virginia, which around that area is the Blair Witch Project Cemetery. Um, we met up with him. Then we hit the Blair Witch Cemetery and a couple of other spots in Burkittsville. It's all very small area. Mm-hmm. And then we called another audible because of timing and we were like fine let's just do it we wound up in dc and we hit a bunch of exorcist spots Mm -hmm. that i had not hit before and then from there well it was exorcist spots blair witch and then we made our way home well wait you did but you also did um forrest gump and dc cab oh that was that was not part of this road trip Oh, okay. You posted them. I thought they were. Okay. Oh, road trip ended with Blair Witch stuff and that access to stuff. And then we already had plans for two weeks later. It was already booked. I think when we were in Graceland, I booked a hotel for Washington, D.C. because my daughter wanted to go back to D.C. Oh, good. So so after the road trip was over, it was like one week back at work. And then the following weekend, we went right back to D.C. Um, and... 
we, I, it was basically we, I wanted to see things not necessarily Delta Bravo related, but since this is what we do, since we're going to these spots, what was filmed over here? So I'm hitting spots by, but they were all pretty much layups. You know, sure. it was yeah. like, okay, the forest gum shot by the Lincoln Memorial looking at the Washington Monument. Mm-hmm. You know, I did those certain different angles. Um, and then I just Googled movies filmed by Washington, by Washington DC monuments. And then I found a really cool one that I've seen years and years and years ago, which was the day the earth stood still, the original. And I'm look, I'm like, wow, like these are cool. Different memorials, Ulysses S. Grant Memorial. Okay, I want to see it, but there's a shot I can get. And then there was wedding, there was a lot of them who were the same angle for the most part. Handmaid's yeah. Tale, Wedding Crashers. I like the Handmaid's Tale God. ones you did. I like those Handmaid's Tale ones. Those yes. are really great. Yeah. yeah, there's a yeah. bunch, you know, there was, you know, Planet of the Apes with Mark Wahlberg. And, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of them were the, basically the same angle, give or take a few inches, but it was all different stuff. So I figured, you know what? They're all easy. I'm here. Let me just bang these all out. Yeah, so we course. did that. And then I wound up getting, <laughs> I posted it, but it was the first time I applied for a library card in 35 years, dude. Because my daughter, I was, I asked my daughter, I was like, what, oh, you know, what do you want to see? You know? And she was like, this place is really cool. And she sent me a picture of the Library of Congress. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you want to go to the Library of Congress? Like, sure, let's go. And now me, of course, movies filmed by the Library of Congress. So it's like, I never seen the movie. I never seen National Treasure 2 Book oh, yeah. of Secrets. Never seen it. Seen the first yeah. one, not the second one. But I'm like, all right, well, that's a cool shot. Like, this place is beautiful on the inside anyway. Yeah. So if yeah. I want to see these things, I'll take a shot, whatever. But we are not allowed to go onto the main reading room without having a card or a membership. So I'm mm-hmm. like, how do I get there? I need to get there. And plus, I just want to see it anyway, because the yeah. architecture is beautiful. I just wanted to see it and experience it anyway. You're not allowed to take pictures in there, but I made sure my volume on my phone is all the way down so you don't hear my camera going off. There's nobody really in there. I look up, and now I took a few shots, and I'm looking at the shot that I take, and the screenshot of like, wrong two statues. And I look. I'm like, okay, wrong one, wrong. Oh, that's where it is. I go around. I have to take different ones to get the right one. So we ended up doing that, but I needed to get a library card. So now I have a library card for the Library of Congress. What better place to go? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, dude. So we did all of that. And that was, like I said, that was after the road trip. And then, uh, yeah. And then yesterday... We're on podcast time, but yesterday, as we're as we're taping this, um, yesterday was Sunday, and uh, me and my daughter, we ran around, we did a few things, and we went to the Stranger Things experience. She wanted to go, so I bought tickets for that. And then it was kind of early still, so she was like, "Dad, what else do you want to do?" I was like, "I don't know. What do you want to do?" She's like, "Well, we've been walking around, so I don't really want to like walk around all over the place." But and it was so awesome that she said it. She was like, "You want to go like." And in these words, you want to go hit Delta Bravo locations? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> right? I'm like, really, you want to? She's like, yeah. She's like, you know what, Dad? She's like, remember a couple of weeks ago, I sent you a picture, and it's, um, it's Andrew Garfield, who played Peter Parker in Spider-Man and The Amazing Spider-Man in 2012. I'm like, yeah. She's like, can we go to that house? I'm like, yeah, it's in Brooklyn. Let's go. So I went, and she's like, Dad, don't go up on their porch. I'm like, I'm going to go, I'm going to see if anyone's home, but there was mail and stuff and newspapers and no one was home. So I quietly, I got my shot. She's like, you're such a weirdo. I'm like, no, I'm not. I got the shots and you know, it's a, it's a, it's a thing with you. Like, this is cool. So oh, yeah. I did those. I'm not a big Spider-Man fan. My daughter loves it. So I did it with her. And then, and then I couldn't believe it because the other day, like last weekend, for the first time ever, she was like, dad, I want to watch Goodfellas. I'm like, oh, wow. I'm like, all right, whatever. So we watch it. And then yesterday she's like, I want to see Goodfellas locations. I'm like, really? I'm like, I hit like 25 spots, but you know what we're going to do? We're going to go to a spot that I have in my phone that mm-hmm. I never went to that we're going to go do together. And she's like, okay. So we went to Queens to Nears Bar, Nears mm-hmm. Tavern. 
And yeah. there's some food in there. So people don't know. It's not like I'm bringing my 12 year old daughter into a dive bar. It's not like that. So I walk in and actually we're walking down the block and I'm like, all right, check this out. This is where Ray Liotta and De Niro are talking and, you know, yeah. talking about Maury and then it, it pauses and that's where Ray Liotta says, and that's when I knew Jimmy was going to whack Maury. And I looked, showed her the screenshot. And I was like, look, you see the signing? She's like, yeah, she's like, yeah. And look, the color of that building is still the same. It's right here. And then she was like, she's like, but you have to back up a little bit to get that shot. I'm like, you're right. I'm just showing you. I know that that's what I have to do, but it's cool that she's yeah. in, in it with me. Yeah. You know, so like, this is awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and then we walked in and uh, I'm not going to be the weirdo because there's some people eating and drinking and whatever. So I walk in, I walk right over to the bartender and I'm like, what's up? I was like, do you mind if I take a few pictures? Cause you're obviously good fellas. He's like, yeah, but I'm going to have to charge like $200 a picture. I'm like, yeah. He's like, no, go ahead, man. Walk around, do whatever you want to do. And I showed him the Ray Liotta one of him walking down the, the driveway. I was like, this is what I do. He was like, wow. He's like, how do you do that? Yeah. So I Photoshop. So I did all that and I posted them. And what was really cool is that Mir's Tavern, the Instagram page, they reposted the whole thing. They put up all of it and they tagged me in it and oh, they reposted amazing. the whole thing. I'm like, that's really cool. So I was in the back and I took shots of all different angles and me and my daughter walked out. I was like, this was so cool. She's like, it was kind of cool, Dad. I'm like, I know. I gave her a little high oh, five. Man. Yeah. That's and he was so like, my daughter was emotional. Yeah, man. It man. was just so cool. And yeah. it's like this whole road trip thing, it sparked like a thing in me where now every year, I mean, just driving across the country and there's no traffic and there's hardly any tolls. Dude, like Tennessee, I think my whole entire toll bill was like $59 and like 47 of it was once I hit Jersey to Brooklyn. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? It was like, it's like Tennessee and Arkansas are completely toll free, 75 mile an hour speed limit. We're flying through these states. There's hundreds of miles of nothing but just beautiful landscape and we uh, you know one thing me and nikki we did not put the radio on one time oh, there was wow. there was no music so huge Done. difference between you and i there because when i do any of my excursions i actually make playlists that go along with the spots I'm going to hit. I get that. I would I do that. To, I actually wanted to talk to you about that at some See, point. Originally, yeah. Nikki was like, we need to make a playlist. I'm like, I'm down. Let's make a road trip playlist. Sounds great. Once we got in and started driving that first morning in Texas to the first spot, it was so peaceful and it just really? felt wow. so good to be in a different place there was no, we were laughing. We were like, this is a Saturday on a Texas highway. Where is everybody? Yeah. Like, where is everyone? We're in Austin. Where is everybody? We were, fl and I guess it just, we were talking and we were laughing and we were just, sometimes there was just silence, not because there's for no reason, just because we were both just looking at the land that's just, we're driving by and yeah, after a while yeah. it was like after like eight hours she was like we didn't even put the radio on and i was like you know what i'm good with that she's like me too just the white noise of the road and just it was just so peaceful and awesome dude so all of that makes me it put the bug in me that every year i'm doing a different road trip and if, depending on where the road trip is, most likely I will always make a pit stop in Tulsa. That's great. So next year, I kind of already have spots. I don't have it mapped out yet. But mm -hmm. next year, I'm going to up the ante. I will fly one way from JFK so once I map it out, it will, I will land somewhere in California. Incredible. I'm going to spend four days, maybe five, just hitting spots in California. Mm -hmm. And then depending on the route, we're going to drive from California. I'm going to map out spots, bop in 
say what's up to Danny in Tulsa and then possibly drop back down or whatever and then go kind of south southwest Tulsa then drop down pass maybe to a different spot of Texas hit New Orleans and then come oh, wow. back up up wow. around like the coast maybe the panhandle of Florida up to Carolinas Georgia and then up so it's going to be we're going to fly from the east coast to the west coast and we're going to drive from the west coast back down under and then over back to the east coast oh, I'm man. approximating 12 to 14 days total jeez that's that next would, year that'll be unbelievable summer 2023 i've heard you talking about it a little bit and i've already started um dropping flags and and, and pins in my maps in in california i've been to california before but never to la and i right. had some pretty good invitations to come out there and and people that will help me hit spots and yeah um, man the, the one thing i want to i actually want to be invited on with when you go don't worry i'm not going to invite myself on a 14-day road trip but i i want to go to hop uh, in dude hop in i want to go up to uh the bronx and hit that uh that drywall in the uh yarn store where they filmed uh where louis cafe was in uh in the godfather because i know your plan <laughs> i know your plan is to go in there with a safety jacket and a and yeah a yeah well, I, I i, I want to pose as like as like an asbestos as an asbestos you know surveyor or something yeah. and yeah. um armed in my back pocket with a little sheetrock knife and i can just see me and joe schellinger with like hard hats on yes i can too <laughs> joe schellinger holding fake blueprints or something yeah, exactly a cup of coffee. Like, like, like nako said well i'll have a coffee and a clipboard and that's and, and right we'll we want. <laughs> dude that yeah. is yeah yeah i love that plan because that, that i know that building is not it's not a, a restaurant anymore it was like a yarn store and yeah, the name moved there. and if you look on google maps there's a phone number, so I'll call that phone number when we hash yeah. out a plan. I don't care. I'll call that phone number and and I'll pose as a buyer or a renter, and then I'll have like you or Joe like distract the guy for thirty seconds while I <laughs> take a square out of the wall and shove it yeah. down my pants or something. <laughs> Just so everybody knows what we're talking about, it's the scene in in The Godfather when Michael reaches up behind the old uh the, the toilet tank, tank toilet tank for the gun yeah that, um, that's that louis cafe is, was uh, yes you see the tank. outline of that toilet tank is still there yeah and it's like yeah. that's where it was so i want a piece of that 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 could very well possibly be a spot where the tape that held that gun was on that sheetrock dude <laughs> like, might be some residue of the tape right yeah, yeah yeah but uh what is it like white plains road up in the bronx yeah like i had the address somewhere yeah. I don't too tell too. anybody I because too. someone will want to steal it from us and i don't mind if other people follow footsteps but the, i call dibs on that piece of wall and i'll get i wanted i wanted to go in there and get it just to have you go and and it's already it's already oh gone. man i would be so you know what i wouldn't even be mad i would be like well played well oh, no, but that's your idea that's totally your idea no but whoever comes with it whoever comes along gets a piece of it i mean that's get a piece saying. yeah of course. And I, know, I know joe was invited so i'm like i think i'm gonna invite well, that's like one of joe's that. favorite movies ever so he's he yeah. his mind was blown that i found that picture he's like where did you get that i'm like yeah. research my man research yeah, there's a lot of cool Godfather spots in New York City. Too, oh, man. yeah, dude. Yeah. Bonucci's house and all that stuff, man. Oh, there's so much. I love it. Well, <laughs> I don't know how much more you want to talk, but this has been amazing. And bro, I'm we're glad. going two and a half hours, bro. I know, Jesus. I know. And I didn't want to stop you because I knew I knew you had a, a, a set. Yeah, um, like an hour and a half in, I'm like, this is going to be a long one because I'm on day two, you know? Yeah, I know. I was like, I was like, you're still in Austin? What? Yeah. What <laughs> yeah, dude. But yeah, man, it was, it was, I mean, I can't say it enough it, it, to, to anybody even if you don't go out and hit spots, if, you, if something like this is just an interest of yours or whatever, I, I can't recommend it enough, dude, like to go out and, and do these things and, and, and just do And what's awesome about the thing, the things that we do, it's, it, there's no rules as far as 
what you have to go. It's whatever you're into, right, you know, yeah. it's, it's your own personal interests, whether it's, I mean, I love hip hop, but I don't know anybody who might not love hip hop as much as you, you know, and it's awesome. And I love all your stuff. And one of my favorite matches that you've ever done, it's probably, it's not even like a, listen, not taking away from anything that you've done because you do incredible stuff, man. But just the way you mash it together and the pattern that you chose was that one shot from the book of Busta Rhymes. Oh yeah, the one at the uh, Liberty State Park. Dude, that is like one of my favorite matches that you've done. I'm like, that's just so, and the way the 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 poles in the background are lined up and just the the yeah. shape of the match that you chose yeah. to do that, I'm like, that right there is one of my favorites across the board from like anybody. It's a cool, it's a cool picture. Yeah. And I don't know why I left it, I left it sort of skewed looking. It's different than I normally do. So I love it. I like that one too. I remember that, you know what was cool about that is those both of the, the, the that day it was kind of like a bonus. I'm like, I always wanted to stop at Liberty State Park because because of the Godfather spot. Gotcha. That's where the that the leave the leave the gun take the cannoli yeah. spot. I'm yeah. like that that's there. Like you can drive through yeah, that park. You can line that up and the, the Statue of Liberty is the marker. You're just right. like, all right, where's the shadow on the Statue of Liberty? Yeah. All right, that's where the car was. Yeah. There's still like tall grass is there. Yeah. Like, this is this is crazy. I'm yeah. here, you know? And then I'm like, all right, where's this Carl Posey Busta Rhymes picture? And I'm like, I, I think it's at this one. I think it's at this one part of the park. And sure enough, I park and I walk and I see all the flagpoles and there's this little grassy knoll where yeah. Buster Rhymes was standing and you kind of come around and everything falls into place. Like yeah. all of the flagpoles and there's trees. Yeah, oh, that's it. Yeah. And I even have some some outtakes of where I, st I stuck the book in the grass and nice. took a picture of the book itself physically. Oh. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure why I left it like that, but I'm glad you I don't know why either, but it's 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 definitely not like your usual style, yeah. but I thought it was great. I think it was yeah. fitting for some reason. But um yeah, and like just to piggyback off what you said, like you just said, wow, this is actually a place that I could actually go to, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, like like I said before, if anyone's watching or listening, it's like no matter what you're into, whether it's sports, hip hop, horror movies, true crime, pop culture, music videos, anything, mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, there's a place that you can go to or visit that these things happen. The place might be changed a little bit. The place could maybe be identical. Like that yeah, one yeah. thing that we did when we were doing the little thing with the documentary thing with the, that, the, the, who was it? Where, where we saw it, it was the, the wooden little awning was still there. Oh, Tony Bennett. Yeah, the Tony yeah Bennett. it was like that yeah. house. It's still the same. And that yeah. picture was from like the 40s or 50s or something like that. And, and there's some still, little like architectural element. You're like, oh, it's still there. It's like, yo, it's and it's there. wood and it's so old, but it's still there. I'm like, that's yeah. just so cool, yeah. you know? It is. I, I I'm not the biggest really Tony is. Bennett fan, but something like that I thought was just awesome like that's really cool that that's still there like that well Ooh, in, in that case his album cover was a delta bravo spot because, yeah. hit because he had taken he had gone back to the same place as mm -hmm. an older man and taken the same spot in front of the same building i'm like well you know he might as well wear the delta bravo hat in right his picture. indirectly <laughs> he yeah by accident he built the bravo yeah. to spot yeah, yeah exactly. so yeah i like i said i can't stress it enough and it's like I know this is, I'm long winded, uh, it be, obviously, because I'm passionate about this stuff and I love this stuff. So I could talk about this stuff for another three hours, but yeah, yeah. I'm not going to yeah. torture everybody. But, um, you know, it's all these experiences like the straight dogs and the, the barbed wire fence and the road trip and no music and all of these things and all these places we, we ate. And it's all of these things that are part of what we do that doesn't show up in the final picture yeah you know what i mean like yeah like the buster rhymes thing like that little quick story like wow like it was a bonus and there's a story behind it and yeah. you know, you'll find yourself eating at a diner or a restaurant that you never would ever be in if you weren't going to look for spots and you meet people and all the nice people walking around oklahoma city and witnessing and like all of those things and the feelings you get and all that stuff you can't put a price on um you know you could be a maniac like me and spend almost four grand on hotels and gas and rent the cars. And, but I didn't care. 
You know what I mean? Because it's not something I do all the time. Listen, right. I put it on a credit card. You couldn't I, wait to do it. You know, I, this, this is what, what I'm going to do. I'll, for, I'll tell yeah. everybody how I did it. For some weird reason, I got approved for a $5,000 credit card. I don't know how. I'm like, okay, road trip. So what I'm going to do, I use that specifically for Delta Bravo stuff. I put all of it on that card over the course of this year. I pay it off. I don't use it for anything else. I pay it all the way down. California, guess where that? But guess what that credit card is for? My whole road trip, and then I pay it off during the year. Road trip, pay it off during. You know what I'm saying? I only use it. I, I'm disciplined like that. I only as long use as you pay that. it off, you're your goal. Of course. Well, that's my goal because I can't wait to go back on the next road trip. So every, I don't pay monthly. Every week, even if it's twenty bucks, it doesn't matter. Every week I put something towards it. Every week, every week. Tax return season, I'll put a chunk towards it. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. So I, I, I've, I've created a way. System, yeah. A system to do the things that I love to do. And, and even, I mean, like I said, there could be something for someone watching that never done this. Uh, you might live in, I don't know, Cleveland, Ohio. I don't know why I just said that. First thing that came to my head for some weird reason. Mm -hmm. Google something of a movie or a sports figure. Maybe you're a huge Cincinnati Bengals fan and one of the guys from the Cleveland Browns. And it's, it's three blocks away from your house where your favorite whoever football player lived. You walk down the block. You never knew that. That's cool to you. Like, wow, my favorite, you know. Icky Woods from the Cincinnati Bengals lived yeah. around the block from me. I didn't know that. Holy shit. Yo, did you know that? No, I had no idea. How cool is that? That's a dinner conversation with your family. You know what I mean? Just things like that, man. Collect, me who said it? Collect memories, not things, you know? I think Joe, Joe Schellinger quotes yeah. that a lot. Yeah, that and give a good day. Love yeah, those things. Good. Give a good day, you know, yeah. make someone smile, tell someone about something, you know, it's a, it's a great hobby. The guys that do this stuff, the Delta Bravo team who actually go out and hit spots and even the group on Facebook, it's not a competition. There's no back and forth. No one discusses politics or there's none of that. I'm sure everyone has their own political, religious views, standpoints. You know what? It's not my business. We don't discuss that stuff. Regardless of all that, we all get along. We follow in each other's footsteps. We inspire each other to hit certain spots. It's all love. It's all this drama free. We help each other out hitting spots. Like you, Danny Johnson hit the alleyway where John Dillinger was gunned down. You did it yourself and you gave him props following in Danny Johnson's footsteps. I saw you read that and I smiled. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Well, then you that's know? just the thing. Like I know, I know Danny through this. I know you through this. And what's, what's I find fascinating is that you and I both love this the same way. And I think we're probably really different people and we have like a lot of really different interests and that's totally, yeah. that's a good thing. Yeah. And that's what, and we're bringing, we're bringing our own perspectives to it. And, uh, and I love, I love the idea of giving each other props. I, 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 whenever I'm uh, talking about Delta Bravo, I never want to claim that I'm discovering anything. I talked oh. to Danny, Danny O'Connor about that. And, you know, he's like, you know, th there was an initial, an original group and they would, they would get, all bent out of shape if you're like hey i hit this spot i found this you didn't find, a, you didn't nothing. find anything dude and i'm like well i found it for me you know i i found it for the first time for me right. and so i stopped maybe using that language but i i never want to claim i'm finding anything occasionally yeah. and and it's and it feels great when you do and you know right. no one else has found a spot but somebody took the picture sure. so somebody's been there before you yeah uh, but I love I love running it down, and I like trying to figure it out myself. Yeah. And if I have to, if I if like Danny Johnson um, gets somewhere, and I'm like, oh man, like like he's done all, all really some amazing things in New Orleans and, yeah. and in Chicago. So when I was there, I was I was glad to have his footsteps to follow and yeah. his his mash. And then what's nice about it is we could all do the same exact location 
it's going to look different yeah. because we have different styles and different approaches and different yeah. ways of framing it and formatting it. This, this, um, this spots that Danny Johnson did that I can't wait to hit myself. Exactly. Like oh. New Orleans, like Angel Heart. Like when yeah. I saw he did it, I was blown away. I'm like, this is so awesome that he hit that because yeah. I cannot wait to go there. One of my favorite movies. And I was that some of those are some of my favorite mashes ever. Like just because yeah. I love that movie and I cannot wait to go to the motel where Mickey Rock was in that movie. And I, and I, I want to be able to. Yeah. I hit, I I hit to Angel Hearts logo too. Yeah, to hell logo. yeah! <laughs> I hit Angel Heart spots in Coney Island and in Chinatown here. Not a lot of it was filmed there, but every spot that I could find in, in New York of Angel Heart, I hit it. But yeah. a lot, most of it was filmed in New Orleans, and yeah. I gotta hit those spots like crazy. You know, yeah, I was looking at him for like a year going, how, wait, how does he do Chicago and New Orleans? And right. now he's in California. Like, wait yeah. a minute. Like, I'm envious for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, healthy, healthy envy. But I'm like, I, I got to step it up. I got to keep up. I got to do, I got to get more. Uh, you know, yeah, well, his, his job lets him travel. Yeah. It's like Joe. Yeah. It's like Joe. Dude is on a, a work, on a work convention job and he's in Hawaii hitting Hawaii. spots. I'm like, Who's better than you, man? Like, that's amazing. That's cool. Well, you have a pretty nice setup, too. You walk out of your job and you're in the middle of New York City. Oh, dude. I I mean, literally about 500 feet from where I sit every single day is the train tracks where Benny Blanco shoots Carlito Brigante. Like, it's right. And I was supposed to, I was supposed to catch up with you this past weekend and I didn't make it up there, but it's fine, uh, dude. Listen, it, it'll happen. It'll happen. I, I'm here all the time. I, my job isn't going nowhere. And anytime you're in the city during the week, come meet me. If you're in the area, come meet me. I'll take you through, get Grand Central spots ready. There's one yeah, yeah. shot from State of Grace of Sean Penn that's in Grand Central that I just don't have access to yet only because I can have my boss get me access, but I think that's cheating. I, um, I want to get it because the whole spot, there was an area that a couple of stores had like a fire or something like that a couple of years ago. And it's been blocked off ever since there's actually no right. access to it, but that's right. the, all, the four corners of the exact of the actual terminal are open except for the one damn corner that I need to get to my like, dad. Yeah. 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 I just but, followed in Danny's footsteps this past weekend because I went up uh to New York and I um he had done the Strange Days cover from the doors. Yeah. And that's um that's pretty cool. I I, I think that might have been the first time I kind of talked with him online. I was like, how did you do this? Because he I guess the front of the album and the back of the album are both from the same photograph. Right. He just it in half and yes. put one on the front and on the back. And uh he told me like he had a cool interaction with somebody who opened the gate and let him let him back there. I ended up taking the pictures without having the gate open, and I think it, it's going to work out. But right. I think he had a good story about it. So awesome. just goes to show you, man. If you talk to people, I, I find myself I'm usually pretty quiet with, yeah. with strangers, but if I'm trying to get a spot, I might be a little a little more apt yeah. to strike up a conversation. Uh, show them what I'm doing on my phone and try to get yeah. somewhere where I wouldn't normally be able to. I get. do. I do that all the time only because I don't really want to approach people and talk to them, but I'm here and I don't want to leave here without my shot or at least yeah. literally actually giving it a, my, my all to get the shot. You yeah, know? absolutely. So, so yeah. listen, um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm going to try to remember there's a couple of sponsors that we got. Uh, yes, let, let me, let me see if I can do this. It's, uh, do you? I have to ask. Do you drink coffee? <laughs> I do. All right. Well, Dead Sled Coffee, right? You yes. And I'm not. I don't know if they have a slogan, but Dead Sled Coffee is a sponsor for mission statements. And uh, Tom Lafave up at Stroud in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. He yeah. has Main Street Jukebox. Is yes. that right? Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. And awesome. So, and he's a, He's he's a great guy. He's very supportive. He's a Delta Bravo guy too. So um, yes. Uh, you know, check that out. I actually, it's not close to where I live, but I, I would love to do a road trip up there. It looks like a great uh, shop. And, yeah, and man. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, support those guys. And and here's a little discount for anyone listening. If you go to deadsledcoffee.com and you type in the promo code 
Delta Bravo, you will get 20% off of your order. And follow them at, that's like coffee on Instagram, and Main Street Jukebox at Main Street Jukebox, M-A-I-N-S-T Jukebox. All right. Did I miss any? Is there, is there no, any? you're mint. No, you're perfect. Right. Look at you. See that? See, I, 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 if I decide to ever hang up my hat, which I do never, I never see that happening, I pass the torch to you. You're like a natural. <laughs> well, hey, I, I, I really mean it when I said I wanted you to have a chance to tell your story because uh, it's a great story. And you had, um, you know, you put all of this energy and this time to walking the walk. Yeah. The thing that we all want to do and the thing that, that we all we all sort of aspire to do is to find spots and share them. And you just you made a whole two week trip out of the out of doing that. So it's, yeah. it's great. And you shouldn't have to feel bad about telling a long story because we no. have this format now. You know, Listen, where... if, if, if you cut, if you cut it off, just remember where you cut it off at and just continue on. If it's if you can't listen all in one shot, I don't right. see how someone can listen to a three hour podcast in one shot. But hey, if you do, yeah, more power to you. But I like the long, I like the long format because then you know, we can get into into the into the, what makes things great, the all of the nuances and all of the stories. So yep. more power to you, man. Yeah, I'm so man. glad that I'm so glad to do all this. It's it's I, I I so look forward to it all the time. Awesome. Yeah, me too. It's good times. All right, man. All right. Dude, well, thank you for being guest host. Yeah. This anytime. was a blast. I hope I can come on once uh, another time. Yeah, anytime. Yeah, awesome, dude. Well, right. listen, once once I kill it, just don't don't sign off because we'll uh, we'll talk, uh, you know, gotcha. without being recorded. All, All right? right, great. Until All then, right. Delta All Bravo right. does it better. All right, peace. Thanks, brother. <laughs>